Welcome everyone. Today is Tuesday, July the 6th, 2021. This is a work session of the Board of County Commissioners. Uh, my name is Patty Clapper and I'm filling in for Chairman Kelly McNicholas Curry. So I will be hosting this meeting. And with me, I have on the Zoom from his home in Brush Creek, I have Greg Postman. And from Alaska, we have Steve Child, who is sitting at the end of a runway sort of experience, zooming into our meeting, for which I greatly thank him for making the effort because we would not have had a quorum. Uh, our other commissioner, Francie Jacober, is uh, down in Denver and is not able to call in. So we do, are you getting mosquitoes there, Steve? <laughs> So we are, um, we're going to begin our meeting with a presentation, an update on the DOLA planning grant, three county solar and storage study, action plan overview. So Cindy, take it away. And we have Mona Newton here from CORE, and we have Zach here, who is our climate action long-term planner, Zach Hendricks. We, he is a man of multi-titles. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'm Cindy Hickley. I'm the Community Development Director. And with us today, we have Mona Newton, Erica Spark, I see Catherine Rushton, and I'm not sure if Alice is going to be on the last layer. No, I guess not. Um, with us, this was a grant that the Board of County Commissioners provided $25,000 to help with. Um, it's a multi jurisdictional, three county grant with Garfield County, Eagle County, and Pitkin County to look at the um, um, potential for solar in our area. And so with that, Mona has the presentation and I'm gonna turn it over to Mona. Great, welcome Mona. Thank you very much. Um, let's see, I'm gonna try to share my screen. Michaela, I think it was uh, Charlotte suggested that you would allow me to do that. So I'm trying to. Make sure I can make that happen. There you go. Oh, can you all see my screen? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Let's see if I can up this right over here. All right. So thank you, Cindy, so much for getting us on the agenda and keep keying this up for us. So yeah, we have been working on this project calling it the Three County Solar Plus Storage Plan. And it was primarily funded through Department of Local Affairs. And then we got partnership funding from Eagle, Pitkin, and Garfield County. And then Garfield Clean Energy contributed in some funding to support the acceleration of the, or not the acceleration, but the management of the overview of the project. So here's just an overview of what we're going to talk about today. We're going to give you an idea of who participated in the project, give you a little background about it and its purpose. And then the most interesting thing, I think, is the, draft, the key findings and then our action categories that we've developed. And then we have the next steps in implementation. And part of what we wanted to do today was to really be able to get your feedback. And, with the three of you at the end, and then hopefully the other two county commissioners and staff input as well. So I'll share that with you today. So as I mentioned, we've got the county, the counties, the state, and then the three nonprofits working together, Rocky Mountain to Clear Clean Energy Economy for the region. I think you all know those folks. We've got Catherine and Erica with us today, and then for Community Office of Resource Efficiency. And then we utilized a mapping firm and an economic consultant to really bolster our research and uh, the study, actually. So just a little state context here. As you know, the Polis administration has really prioritized uh, the greenhouse gas roadmap and within that he wants a just and equitable transition to renewable energy and pollution reduction. He wants to diversify and strengthen our economy and improve the health and well-being of our communities. And so this is really motivated by the transition to cleaner energy. So the DOLA grant, when we, uh, and you all got a presentation, I think, well, we, I know you did, because um, you approved the funding, 
several months ago or last year, I think it was, um, they approved a package of five different projects for the solar plus storage project. And one is the regional energy inventory to quantify energy use, cost, and emissions in the built environment. And we're using that as our baseline. And I wanted to say that's different than the emissions inventory that we're also working on right now and expect to get back in early 2022. So this is just an energy inventory of the built environment, and this is not a contribution. And then the second piece is a study of the potential for further development of solar energy along with battery storage. And so we're Whenever we looked at the potential for solar, we always wanted to include storage with it as well, because although we do have Excel and and Aspen Electric in this service area of the three counties, Holy Cross is by far the largest utility, and we know that they want to couple solar plus storage. And then the third item is an online toolbox of resources that can inform landowners and local governments about successful project development. And that is really, it's a, um, that, that's a really nice map and that we can use. And then we also have developed, uh, the fourth component was a toolbox, that we call, as we call it, to streamlining the permitting process for solar energy projects. And then the final piece is an economic transition assessment to look at what are the regional economic opportunities and also the challenges as the state works towards the 100% renewable energy targets and our role in providing some of that renewable energy. So the purpose of this uh, solar plus storage plan is really to create a vision about how solar and storage can um, accelerate our progress to a clean energy future. We've all set goals. All three counties have varying goals of, of um, what a clean energy future can look like. We want to provide some really practical information so that we can empower communities and residents and organizations and so that we can play an active role in helping Colorado reach the 100% renewable energy goal. We also know we need to identify barriers and action steps and then we also need, we want to develop a replicable approach to help other regions tap solar plus storage. We've seen other communities from different states developing a similar plan. So, so to start with the draft key findings, I think you'll find this interesting. Energy use in the built environment in 2019, buildings and industry in Garfield, Eagle, and Picking counties used 1.8 6 million megawatt hours of electricity and 119.5 million therms of natural gas. And then in 2019, lighting, powering, and heating buildings and industry cost us $186.5 million and $72 million for natural gas. So that's a total of $258 million for electricity and gas. So that's quite a bit. You know, on the chart on the right, you can see the, the breakdown for the three county area and the, you know, still in the residential in Pitkin County in particular, it's residential and commercial um, are a smaller portion of the pie, just based probably on our population than what um, the Garfield and Eagle County. And again, I want to emphasize this did not include transportation energy, just building in. So what we find also is that the current grid, and this is again for three counties, is the, is a total of 24, point, uh, 24 megawatts of net meter solar capacity. And then we have eight and a half megawatts of community solar, community scale. What we could have is 31.25 megawatts of capacity from proposed. This is a, the planned solar for future and connections. And then local power, we expect that local power generation will increase to 63 megawatts over the next three to five years. But wait, what we can find, see is that as of 2019, our local solar production is really only 1% of our total of regional electricity, so we have a lot of room to grow. 
So one of the things that we looked at as part of this project is what our resource potential is. So that's all the potential solar that we could have. And then we looked at the, then we pulled that down to what's the technical potential. So based on grid constraints, land use constraints, topographic constraints, and then PV systems and efficiency. And then we whittled that down even further to look at what the market potential is for um, that that would include the economic competition, what kinds of regulatory constraints we have, what kind of utility policies there are, and then based on current utility programs. So this is based on what's current. And then, um, and so you can see that with the technical potential, we could really do 487 megawatts. With the market potential, that whittles it down to about 232 megawatts, but still we could increase our local solar production to 26% from 1% to 26%. So there's pretty, and that's just on the community scale solar projects. We need to do some further analysis on the market potential for the net metered rooftop solar plus storage um, and what that uh, might look like. And especially as you know, things are changing. Uh, Zach mentioned net metering. That's probably going to change, although at the recent bill that went through the Colorado legislature, I believe you can net meter up to 200% of your power that has, that has to be allowed. That's you know, applies to the large utilities. Fortunately, Holy Cross tends to go the way of larger utilities. So. Um, some draft key findings for economic benefits, that means energy savings, we could save about $19 million per year from 2022 to 2040, and increasing about, um, increasing jobs annually, um, 260 jobs. So that would if we built the 232 megawatts of new solar and storage. Property tax revenues would increase by $26.5 million over 30 years, and then land land lease revenue would increase over $31 million. So that's you no know, economic boost to our economy. Um, what, we, what we do have, or what we looked at, are some other economic benefits is the um, re reduced demand cost for distribution utilities. And that's primarily for Holy Cross. If we have storage coupled with, with the solar and they can access that storage during times of peak demand, that would drive down their peak demand and reduce their cost. And then there is locational value for solar and storage that could allow utilities to avoid some of their upgrades, their grid, their utility grid upgrades. And, and we have mapped some of that out as part of this project. So, and then the value of resilience. We know that um, community solar and storage can have a certain amount of energy resilience, especially during a time of natural disaster. I think you know, after the Lake Christine fire, we really started talking about resiliency and what that might look like, and especially with transmission lines. I mean, there's still some opportunities uh, that we can pursue, especially with solar. We could do something, for example, at Aspen High School and have a battery there, and that could be, that could be a community shelter that has electricity if needed, or there could be another location, something along those lines, just as an example. So, of course, we also found barriers to this uh, idea of, that we want to promote, and there's some regional barriers there. There's the lack of joint transmission planning, and that's that, you know, joint transmission planning, if that was occurring between Excel and Holy Cross and other utilities, then you could build larger solar projects and you could just wheel that energy back and forth. And then there's, and if we did that, though, we'd have to deal with the transmission charges and the wheeling fees that occur with that. Um, barriers, there's a lot of barriers to standalone storage, and so it does require, if you're going to try to take the investment tax credit, you have to co-locate that with solar in order to get credit for it. And then sometimes it's not always, uh, standalone storage is not always, is not recognized as a qualifying facility under PERPA, that's a public, public utilities regulatory policy act. So. 
that's some challenges at the federal level, but they're still can be overcome. So again, we've got to think about how we overcome some of these barriers, some of the grid constraints on the technical side, some of the land constraints. The, on the market side, we need to think about uh, what are some of the utility policies, maybe the utility programs, and then um, we need to remove some of the market barriers and capture so we can capture more of the potential technical capacity. So, so part of the other thing that we wanted to do is, as part of this, as I mentioned earlier, one of the five key things was to develop a draft action plan. And this is where we really want some input from the, uh, the key stakeholders like you all, the county commissioners. Um, and that is we set this up in terms of categories. And each category actually has a number of steps below them that go into more detail. And the, what we want is for example, we'd like to see some commitments and policies to develop local plus local solar plus storage. We see opportunities for more funding and low cost financing resources. There's a lot of funding available, but it's not always low cost. Um, we feel like there could be some more investment in regional expertise and capacity building to continue to accelerate the clean energy progress. As I mentioned earlier, we could have some utility regulatory and infrastructure improvements that could increase the amount of solar that we could put on, we could build in our three county region. Uh, best land use practices is another category for solar plus storage development. I know Pitkin County has been working on your land use, um, your land use regulations the last year and a half or so. And, to make it easier for solar to build small solar projects next to sites or a community solar project for the caucuses. We need, you know, more of that kind of work done. We need some supportive tax policies and improved incentives at the federal level. For example, it'd be nice if uh, when Picking County develops a project and puts it on your on the roof or a large project around a facility, if you could take the ITC, the investment tax credit is a grant instead or something along those lines that bring the cost down for you. Um, expanded economic development support to rural regions and all transition economies. That would be great to get some support from the state. And again, all of these, these are just major categories that we've come up with. And the last one is education and training. And we have a lot of detail of, below those. So we've identified some organizations and entities that can help play a role in that local government and regional collaboratives, utilities, state and federal agencies, ed educational institutions. We've talked about CMC becoming more workforce training, economic development organizations can certainly play a role, energy partnership. The PUC, of course, has a role, the state legislator, investors, foundations, bullets philanthropists, businesses, and of course, households and organizations can get involved in this. So we are going to be giving multiple presentations between um, now and the end of the month. We're going before, I think we have a presentation before the Garfield Clean Energy this later this week and then next week before Eagle County Commissioners and then at some point Garfield County Commissioners We'll also be presenting to Holy Cross and to other organizations. And then um, we'll wrap, be wrapping up this report and submitting it to DOLA for, um, you know, final as a final project here. Then our next steps really are to start pursuing some implementation funding. As you know, there's some, in, there has been some renewable energy funding that was allocated to DOLA, Department of Local Affairs. And then we expect funding to come through the Department of Energy. And so I think implementation funding might be an opportunity. And so we'd like to continue to use, we'd like to take this information that we've been able to gather and then we um, and then continue with some regional collaboration and then 
hopefully we'll be able to reach this goal of 232 megawatts in the not too distant future. So, as I mentioned, or I didn't, I did mention at the beginning, we would like to really get um, your input. And so we have um, an opportunity. We have created. I think Erica has created an online form that you all could fill out. We can email you the draft action plan and then a Google form so you could submit your feedback and your input. And we'd really appreciate that. I'm wondering if that's something that you would be able to do and, and work with. So. Okay, Mona, are you wrapped up? I am, and I want to thank you for your support and for your participation in the project. Well, I'm going to look at Cindy and Zach to see if you have anything you need to or would like to add. No, I don't think so. I think the conversation now would be good just to start uh, where Mona left off and see how applicable the board thinks this uh, master plan is and some of the action steps. Oops. And some of the action <laughs> steps that um, should be taken. So I don't know if anybody heard that, but um, that we would like to just go ahead and get into conversation about the applicability of the plan okay. and where to take it. Okay. So Zach, did you have anything? Not at this time. Okay. So Greg, please. Yeah. Hi. Thank you. This is great. Great to see everybody, and it's wonderful to have this presentation. So uh, and Catherine and Erica, thanks for being here. Um, uh, and Cindy and Zach, I see you there too as well. So thank you all for being there. And Mona and I have been speaking earlier today. Um, I think this is good. There's a lot to digest, a lot to go through. I'm wondering just how comprehensive it is regarding, uh, say, the individual homeowner. Who's is, is, is this solar and plus storage for me as a homeowner? Or is this solar plus storage for something like our solar farm project or something larger and more commercial? Um, so maybe a little bit more information just on uh, the, the difference between a, gar a community solar garden and rooftop solar. You know, how do we distinguish between a, a big commercial project and individual projects, and how will they how are they will they fit into this so we can start rallying people to engage? So first of all, the math that we've done identifies land parcels that are will host five megawatts or larger. And we've identified those and we've layered them for public and private land, and how close they are to utilities, and we use some other criteria. So that that's the mapping piece of this, and that's, that's pretty important. For the homeowner, as I mentioned, we haven't done as much of the rooftop analysis yet. So can the rooftop, can the homeowner utilize that? To some degree, I mean, a homeowner can inquire about solar for their home by contacting the local or that kind of thing. What we want to be also be able to do, or what we have done, is look at public facilities like county buildings and larger buildings. But we haven't, you already have solar on your home, Greg, but for example, you would not necessarily plug into that. But we would certainly like homeowner support and homeowners to continue to add solar to their homes and their business. Greg, is that all? Steve? You know, I think I think the only thing I would add is that at times um, it's confusing to know who to turn to and where to go. So whether whether I go to CORE or CLEAR or look for a contractor or contact Holy Cost directly, um, as you may have all seen on social media, there we're being assailed, or at least I am, maybe because I talk about it a lot, assailed by all the, the ads from various dubious looking contractors for solar, free solar and stuff like that. If you see those ads that are coming in, they don't really cut to the chase about how you're actually going to put solar on your roof. But there's a lot of interesting uh, bait and fishing going on out there. And, and I think the best thing might be just to contact the utility directly to find out. But um, I keep thinking, wow, I should really know, know how to go about doing this. And I'm not totally clear uh, and if I can't figure it out, I'm wondering how many other people can. So um, I guess my, my feeling would be let's just make sure this is a really uh, – we, we have a roadmap that anybody who's interested can follow and know how to get in and get engaged. Um, and that's I, I know that's coming, but that's, that's what I'm looking for now. 
Yeah. Good. Well, we definitely want to make, we want to do more outreach and education. And, and you're right, it is important for people to know who to contact and how to get engaged in this. And of course, Claire, I would say if you're in Pitkin County, call CORE. And I'm sure Claire would say if you're in, in Garfield County, please call us. And Rocky Mountain State, please call us in Eagle, in Eagle County. So, yeah. Okay, great. Steve, did you have something? Yeah, a couple of things. Um, I'm going through the process right now of trying to get a project, a net metering project at our own house. And so it's very enlightening to me to see, you know, sort of the impediments that I have bumped into. Um, one of the impediments is that the Holy Cross line in Snowmass and Capitol Creek needs upgrading. And so anybody doing, at this point, doing a, a homeowner's solar project needs to put money in to help pay for those upgrades. Mm -hmm. And in my case, the woman at Holy Cross Energy calculated that we would have to pay about $2,000 upfront to just help pay for the upgrades. Some mm -hmm. of that could could get reimbursed as more people put rooftop solar on and also pay in to pay for the upgrades. But for a lot of people, that would be a, just an extra cost up front. It's an impediment to somebody even doing a project. They might be stretching it to even, you know, put pay for the solar panels and the getting connected. So that's something that potentially the, the county or or could help on uh, helping fund the c connectivity thing or the infrastructure upgrades that Holy Cross needs to do. Uh, second impediment that I see is for reaching our full goal of, you know, by 2050 having so much solar. Um, I'm limited to, I think it's 120% of the previous year's electric usage in terms of what size of solar array that I could put on my house. Now I could make that higher if I bought an electric car right now and that could be added on to the total amount of panels that I have. But if we're trying to maximize the amount of electricity we're producing from homeowners, uh, they're, they're limited, they're trying to keep it close to the amount of electricity they're actually using for their house and not generating extra electricity to put into the grid that Holy Cross might or might not need. But if we're going to reach the goals, they do need all the electricity that generates locally that they can get. So at some point, that 120% thing might need to be revisited. It's probably a PUC thing or something. It's probably out of Holy Cross's hands on that matter. I probably wasn't as clear as I could have been because the legislature did have a piece of legislation that will allow you to uh, go up to 200% of your capacity in anticipation of electric cars and added um, electric devices like cold climate heat pumps and stoves and whatnot, that kind of thing. And I, I think what I've heard, I've heard a rumor that Holy Cross is going to adopt that as well. The Holy Cross board will adopt that same piece of legislation as a policy that they'll honor. I, I would okay. also well, like to... Wait, let, let's, yeah. uh, Zach has some... Like to, wait, build as big as I could right away. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, Zach. Yeah, has... I'd also like to clarify that 120% currently is just for net metering. You are able to put on as much solar as you want. They just won't pay you back for it, and that's just a sheer economics fact. They can buy um, a kilowatt hour much cheaper from a utility scale distribution of renewables than they can from an individual household. And so that's merely an economics point on that. But you can put as much solar on your house as you want. You're just only going to be net metered up to the 120 percent. Or to now the 200. To now to the 200, yes, when that bill takes effect. Okay, okay that's good to know. Um, then a couple other points. In my case, I'm thinking that a ground-mounted solar thing in a location outside of our currently approved building envelope is, would be the best place to put our solar array at my house. So 
So in order to make it happen on that site, I need to go through a land use planning process to expand my building envelope from what it is now. Um, so I have to go through a county process. I could put rooftop solar on. It wouldn't be, it's really not what I think is the best system for my location right now. We have a good on the ground site that is close to the meter on the power pole and I think would be a really a good location. Um, it hasn't been analyzed yet, but anyhow, that's just one more impediment, the land use process that I have to go through to get there. Yep. Um, and, wait, then in wait, terms wait, of Steve, where, wait. Does a, where does a homeowner start? Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I think, I think there's a, a comment to that thing about land use. Um, you actually, all of you, fixed that um, in 2019. So we do have a yeah. land use exemption for building envelopes, so long as you're not proposing this, uh, the renewables in a constrained site. So a steep hill, wildlife, something like that. So we do actually have an exemption in our land use code to permit people to build outside of their current building envelope. Yeah. Okay. 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 That's good. So, yeah, there's lots Thank of people you, a homeowner has to talk to. I started out by calling Sunset Solar, who I've known Scott Ely for years and years, and I want to do my project through them. I really like their company. So then they connected me to Holy Cross. So it's been a back and forth between Sunset and Holy Cross Energy. Um, and core i think will be involved at some point and maybe community development will be in, involved at some point so that that is that sort of process is confusing to a, to a homeowner where they don't they don't know where to start uh who to talk to first all the hoops you have to jump through to get there and the more we can expedite that for a homeowner that that would be good Great. Thank you, Steve. We can work on that. Like, sure. you know, maybe a simplified checklist if you don't already have one that you can hand out to people and they can just go down the list. But, Steve, that's a great idea. Yeah. Steve, did you have anything else before I – Greg? Well, I was Wait. curious. The one, one more thing, Mona, you mentioned um, a questionnaire that you wanted but you would like us to fill out. Do you want us to fill that out individually or as individual – people who happen to be BOCC members, or do you want us to have a, an official Picking County BOCC uh, questionnaire filled out, or both? I, well, I think we, if you, when you fill it out, we'd like it to be individual, and we'd like it to be as a, as a Picking County commissioner. What else would you like? And we have several questions that Erica has put together, and I can pull it up on the screen if you'd like to see it. We can, you know, we can. We'll plan to email that to you along with the the action plan, the draft action plan. You can read that for in depth, and then give us that feedback. We'd appreciate it as a picking county. Yeah, I would suggest you send it to us directly if you want to make sure that we fill it out and send it back. It's probably the best way to get to us. Great. Now, Steve, are you done? Because I think Greg has more. Thank you, Steve. Uh, okay, great. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Steve, for asking those questions. That's all really valuable. And and uh, Zach for the surprising response. So, hey, we already did that. And I, I didn't remember that. Yeah. Um, uh, I I was just thinking as a from a consumer of, of the technology um, that we're using with our solar panels. I put panels in a couple of years ago, and honestly, they're already outdated. I Had I waited six months, my solar panels would probably produce 25% more energy than they do. And, and so I'm a little frustrated as a consumer because I just can't keep upgrading. And I've been, I follow the electric vehicle threads. And a lot of the time it's about this upgrade path, which is kind of like your phone or your computer now for cars and for the technology of solar or EVs. And, and so people are talking about leasing so they can continue on the upgrade path and keep getting the better stuff. And so I'm just wondering, um, have those conversations, have you been having those conversations? How would a, how can somebody stay abreast of what's happening? If I want the, the dual panel, dual face solar panels that produce 400 watts instead of the ones I bought two years ago that produced 300 watts, um, can I do that? Is it worth it? Or am I stuck with the, 
the lower producing panels. Then in, the, in some cases, it really may make a difference to somebody who has a limited amount of space, like my roof space only has so much. Um, so that was one of the questions is, are, will there be interesting uh, and can we work toward interesting ways of financing with lease programs or uh, just ways to, to remove those barriers to entry for people who would do this if it was easy enough and they could afford it? I think that's a great recommendation for you to add into this form we want to send you because we're looking at how do you finance, how do you create better funding mechanisms, what are some new market opportunities for the solar companies, for example, because I think that's the that's a great uh, suggestion, Greg. I, it might be a little bit more difficult than it sounds, you know, for somebody to come in and you sign a package. I know that recently we had received a notice from Enphase, those are the inverters on the system I have, and they said, hey, you can upgrade all of your inverter because the system's about 10 years, you can, for, and you can uh, upgrade all the inverters for $650. And it's like, wow, what a great deal because you're going to get the most, the newest inverters because that's what's likely to go out. Your panels, by just putting them on, they've got a 25-year, 30-year guarantee on them. They're going to continue to produce. So, you know, you've got really, even though it sounds like you're not up to the latest technology, it's pretty good. So I think there's some opportunities, and we like that kind of input from you when we send this Google form out. Well, I think I may have in phase also. I'll have to go back and look to see if I missed <laughs> that email. But uh, uh, staying abreast of that's a little tough, but... Um, having a clearinghouse, you know, having clear and core work together on this, super important to me. I think that really helps and, and, uh, making it effortless for people to at least learn more is the first step. Uh, because I, everyone I talk to would like to be participating on some level. So I'm looking forward to your questionnaire. Thank you. I'm at, okay, Steve, go ahead. Um, I have questions about uh electricity storage systems i know holy cross has a program now that you could get the tesla batteries lithium ion batteries and um have them in a climate controlled part of your house or in a building where you could store electricity but we're going to need i think a lot of electricity storage systems whether they're industrial scale or homeowner scale, uh, I could actually see a business opportunity for a business or a homeowner who wanted to invest in a bigger battery storage system, and they would be willing to sign a contract with Holy Cross or with Aspen Energy or with Excel, where they would store electricity at uh, when there's excess electricity in the line that's not being used. They could store electricity in their system in exchange for being able to then sell it, get paid a premium to deliver it during peak usage times. Uh, I would love to see that be uh, looked into to see if that would be feasible. Maybe it wouldn't be feasible for a, on a homeowner scale, but if, if there were a business that, who wanted to go into electricity storage as part of part of their business model, I think we should investigate that as a possibility. So I can jump in there real quick. So the program is Power Plus is the one you're referring to with Holy Cross. Um, first off, the reason they require the Tesla Powerwall is that um, networks with their current grid management system, which gives them the capability to discharge as a whole. So instead of having to individually tap into each and every single battery, they can just press a button and discharge all of them at once. And so that's why they have that current restraint on that is what that's what links into their grid at the best. Um, the second part is, is that program, you're only limited if you're having them finance the batteries for you. They do have a bring your own device portion of that program where you can hook in more and sign up for the net metering component of that as well. And then the last part of that is they are looking to go towards the commercial and industrial side storage. Um, however, there are a lot of additional ramifications that come from systems of that size. Um, there's greater fire hazard. You have to make sure you have all the shutoffs. So they're kind of taking a careful approach to that to make sure that they can do that in a way where it has the best bang for the buck. And they're considering all the other safety repercussions that come with it. Good point. Okay, I'm going to add just a few things real quick. Um, 
I think presentations valley wide, but um, are you going to tap into the municipalities because we need the partnerships, not just county wide and energy company wise, but by uh, the municipalities too. Because I know the city of Aspen Council, city council would, and Snowmass would like to hear this, as would Basalt. So yeah, that, I they agree with you. Okay. So yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and you did uh, mention um, economic expanded economic development support. Um, you know, I do sit on the executive board for the Northwest Cog Economic Development District. So maybe mm -hmm. at some point we can talk about doing a presentation at one of our EDD meetings. Um, it would be, oh, you know, the 15 would be, you know, have to be condensed, but I think that would be great to reach out to those, um, those members which are across the Rocky Mountain region. So I can touch base with Cindy and Zach on that, Mona. Okay. That'd be great. Thank you, Rodney. As you mentioned, we'd like to share this information with other entities because I think they'd find it pretty interesting. Yeah, and, and um, the Economic Development District has different, a, a variety of different members, so it would, be, it would be a great opportunity, and we can work on that. And then since we do have Erica and Catherine here from CLEAR, would you ladies like to jump in and add some comments or points for the Board of Commissioners? So, Erica, go we, ahead. Um, yeah, we don't have anything in particular to add. We are just here to help answer questions if anything came up um, in the particulars of the key findings. Um, but we're really, I mean, all of your questions are really great. We are putting together landowner resources for landowners who want to pursue community scale on their land and kind of go through that checklist and steps. Um, but, yeah, there's also a need for just all the different options there are now for rooftop um, yeah, but no, it's great. It's great presenting to you guys and uh, hearing all your questions. Really glad you're engaged. Well, and I want to add something real quick, Steve, and then I'll get um, for marketing for Clear's uh, new uh, rebate program for solar, residential solar. I know this family down in Glenwood Springs who just put solar on. They were the first ones to get a grant through Clear. Um, I know they'd be more than happy to share their story. They have a great little family. They live on South Grand. It's uh, Gordon, Gordon and Tracy Turner, who just happened to be my daughter and son-in-law. And they would be a great example for you to share with the community on we can do it, you can do it. I'm going to volunteer them for your program. <laughs> they don't know anything about my volunteering them, but I just did. So yeah, let me know if you want to get in touch with them. All right, Steve, go ahead. So uh, if someone's doing a community scale solar or willing to do that on their own private property, uh, the biggest constraint really is the capacity of the electric lines, whether they can take that much electricity or not, which Holy Cross has the information. To maybe Core and Clear have some of that information too, but a private landowner might have a great site, but they don't have the power line absolutely is inadequate to carry the amount of electricity they could produce. Um, so to me, part of the solution would be, you know, maybe we need to be upgrading some of the electric lines to just add more capacity for carrying that solar. Uh, then who's going to pay for that? Maybe the government could participate in helping upgrading some of the electric lines if it's really a good project. They just need need another wire strung to the system or something to make it get, put the capacity in there. Yeah. So one more thing to think about. <laughs> well, unfortunately, we have been able to get um, Holy Cross has been very generous with the information that they have about their transmission line. So we do have that information. We do know where they do have capacity and where they have constraints. And yes, but we do need to think about how do we upgrade those transmission lines in order to and maybe we can be creative with the new uh, federal infrastructure dollars that are going to be coming out and put that into I mean, it, it's, it addresses two problems at the federal level both the need for renewable energies and the need for infrastructure improvements so let us know where we can be of help on that one we write great letters to Congress yes thank you yes we do <laughs> uh, any other comments questions input Seeing none, I want to thank everybody, and I think we're going to have Mona on for our next item. And um, thank you. Thank you, Erica and Catherine, for joining us. And um, we're going to move on to our next agenda item. Thank you. Great.
Okay. If you don't mind giving me just a couple of minutes to reorganize here. Okay, then I will very slowly introduce the next item. Our next item is the Community Office for Resource Efficiency Overview of Accomplishments, Future Work, and the Renewable Energy Mitigation Program Funding Request. So um, this has a lot of information in the packet material, which I truly appreciate. And I have a feeling this is going to be shared with um, our partner across the street. Uh, the city already had a presentation okay. earlier. Perfect. So Perfect. Zach, thank you, uh, as always. Okay, let's see what I can do here then. Got my slideshow up. I just need to <laughs> figure out how to get back to you all. <laughs> oh dear. Oh, here we go. And Steve, you're still coming through perfectly from Alaska. Perfect spot. So you're going to be stuck there for the next couple of hours, if not the next couple of days. <laughs> yeah, Steve, that's better than your house, actually. It's clearer and I can hear you better. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. I'm a long ways away. This is the same location my daughter was teaching classes at the University of Alaska from <laughs> on Zoom. With the same backdrop, she. I'm sitting in her van here, but uh, it is. Uh oh. We said. Uh oh. The curse is. So should I get started or? Steve, did we lose you? Um, I'm so sorry that we brought up how perfectly you were coming through. Yeah, I think the van battery died. <laughs> or a bear got him. We'll find out. <laughs> or one of those planes was landing. Yeah. Should I get going or what else? I, I think we can move slowly forward, John, even though we have don't... This has been a question about our quorum, but so in a work session, you're I know. Not making a uh, in a work session, you're not making a decision, and so a quorum isn't necessary, but it is desired given that a future decision is based on the work session. Um, yes, maybe we should give Steve thirty seconds or so to see yeah. if he can log back on, and otherwise, you you can proceed, but you can't really give any direction or no I, I think we can slowly have Mona introduce the presentation and we'll work on getting Steve back so Mona go ahead and slowly <laughs> all righty then mm -hmm. all right can you see my screen here yes we can beautiful picture of the Aspen Mountain in the background Great, thank you. So yeah, I'm here today to give you an update <laughs> and uh, talk about some of our accomplishments and where we're going in the future and uh, potential requests for ramp dollars um, in the coming months. So this is just as I've already done that. So it's gonna be quick, but <laughs> just a little background here. So. The BOS, you all approved two hundred and seventy thousand dollars for the budget year twenty twenty one, and you may, and it was we actually came to you with the how the money was going to be spent. Uh, I think in May or June. So we've been before you quite a bit recently, and in twenty twenty two, we'd like to request half a million dollars from RIMP for our budget. And then uh, we want to update you on our some of our diversification diversification strategies as well. Because we know that with rent dollars declining and still so much work to do around climate action, we need more funding where we need funding to continue the work that we've been able to do in the last 20, um, 20 several, you know, 27 years. So. Um, CORE, as you know, was founded in 1994. Patty, you've been on the board a couple of yep. times. Mm -hmm. And um, it was founded by three utilities, eight communities, and then members of the community. And Bill Sterling is still on our board, and he's currently chair of the board. We're a 501c3, just to remind you, sometimes people refer to us as a as a quasi-governmental organization, but we are a non-governmental 501c3, so we're able to connect with all the vulnerable communities and with everybody in the community. 
And our staff is really, we provide a lot of advising, and that's really how we catalyze the, some of the work that's been done. We, have, we currently have 12 directors on the board, and they're ready to support and influence climate action. So, as I mentioned, we want to we want to request a half a million dollars in 2022 for the 2022, but we know we need to come before you in the fall. When we do use and spend rent dollars, we always leverage that at least three times with, uh, with the funding. And then in 2022, we're looking at how, what is our organizational and financial resiliency going forward? So we're developing uh, uh, fundraising efforts that we have had in the past since we began in 1994 because we have been able to, I mean, in the first few years, CORE really utilized foundation funding and utility funding and community funding. And then with the development of the REMP program, we've been able to access those funds and utilize them. And as I mentioned, get those or um, leverage those at least three times for carbon savings and also dollars. And this year with the declining REMP dollars, we are going to be activating a, more of a fundraising effort than we have in the past with grants and individuals and corporations and whatnot. This is uh, the slide before you is just an overview of what how the funds were spent in 2021. We have a budget of 2.17 million dollars and 1.4 came from the city and then the 270 came from the county. Other dollars come from other members, we have uh, the, so the town of Snowmass, town of Assault, also in the city of Aspen, our members, and Holy Cross. And then we also receive fundings from a few other sources as well. And in 2022, our draft budget right now is $1.9 million. And we have uh, received, I think, some support from the city of Aspen for a uh, budget, uh, again, of one point two million and then we're asking we'll ask for if you support that half a million dollars from the town. So that's what that looks like. And our impact, as you know, we have really been focusing on beneficial electrification in the last year. And we're really trying to help exceed the carbon targets that you all have set and we've encouraged you to set. Um, we focus a lot on high visibility projects. I mean, I probably don't need to, you know, restate the Salt Vista. That's been a very high visibility project. In fact, the governor was here a week or so ago to sign a bill at the Salt Vista. And that was the, that I think was great. I was not able to attend that, but I think Greg was. And then we also, we still really, we know that we have to do a lot of work on existing buildings. And so focusing on building performance with advising, we provide incentives. Steve talked about the, the battery. We're moving away. CORE really has been moving our incentives all along since day one to encourage people to do the next right move to support the climate. And so now our focus is really on uh, cold climate heat pumps with heating systems, not only for existing buildings, but for new buildings. We see the value of those. And some people may say, oh, they don't work in high altitudes or cold climate. That's wrong. They work in cold climates. And there is technology that's been developed by carrier, by Art tech by various companies that work here in our cold climate. And we may need to augment it a little tiny bit with electric, but we don't want to rely on electric. We want to, that's why we call this beneficial electrification. We don't want to go back to using baseboard heating and old technology. That's, that's old inefficient technology. And what we've seen when new buildings are built with electric baseboard heating, while it's cheap to install for the builder um, or the developer, it's not cheap to to pay for by the occupants. And we've been working on um, 
how we can change that modality, especially in affordable housing. And I think Basalt Vista was a good example of what we can do right now. And we don't have to wait for new technology. Uh, we've been really focusing on expanding climate action with our technical expertise. We have on our staff folks to really uh, stay up to date on technical side of things. Marty Treadway and Mike Boucher on the commercial side. And we now have an intern who's an electrical engineer who really understands beneficial expectation, which is important. And I think the other piece is that we have been, we feel like we've been really responsible in managing and administering the rent dollars. As Cindy knows and Greg know, we have a finance committee who are overseeing, it's the finance committee of one and myself right now, <laughs> which we just lost Ann Mullins. Hopefully we'll get another board member on there, but we have um, financial responsibility for the managing all of the funds that CORE receives. And um, so, yeah, we take pride in doing that correctly. Just some of our accomplishments in 2019, and, and I want to show 2019 and 2020 because as we all remember, or maybe we've forgotten, we were in the middle of the pandemic, but in 2019, we issued $1.3 million in rebates. And that money gets leveraged, and we secured about $10 million in partner funds. Total project costs were $37 million, and the economic benefit to the community is $83 million. And you may say, well, how does that happen? And studies have shown, economic studies have shown, that for every dollar you spend on energy efficiency and clean energy, you get 2.23 back into the economy. So that's how that was calculated. Um, in addition, we were able to eliminate about almost 7,000 metric tons of CO2, and we have, we're showing about $900,000 in utility savings. That's equivalent to about 1,500 cars off the road. And as when I was talking to Greg, I mean, there were probably 1,500 cars on the road this afternoon. They were passed up to the ABC. <laughs> um, in point, yes. Oh, in 2020, our accomplishments included um, about 800, 800 and almost $900,000 in rebates grants, $850,000. And we were able to leverage double that in partner funds, $1.7 million. And the project costs were $17 million. We still had an economic benefit of $39 million. So we were able to eliminate about half of last year's CO2, um, 3,500 million tons, and then, or metric tons, excuse me, and then about half a million dollars in the annual utility savings and 740. One of the uh, projects that has uh, we've been working on for about a year is the Soldner Center, and it's been delightful working with Captain Soldner and uh, we have a little testimony I, from her. I'm Stephanie Seven. When I think about CORE, the first thing I think about is collaboration. They came to the Goldner Center and listened to us. They listened to our goals and our needs, and then made suggestions as to how we might use our carbon footprint to increase our energy efficiency. Not only that, but they also helped us with implementing the suggestions, both in terms of the technical support, but also with funding, with matching funding which was very important to us. Now, more than ever, it's important to support CORE in its mission and its involvement with our community. Uh, some of the other, as I mentioned, we've been going through, uh, not going through, but we've really uh, embraced beneficial electrification. And we have a number of projects uh, that we've been working on and highlighting over the last year or so. And, our, and we started out with the path to zero, and that focuses on existing buildings, homes, and businesses, multifamilies. We're just really trying to create some replicable models with that. We have SECO housing. Um, SECO housing, uh, that is 150 bedrooms. You've probably been reading a few, a little bit about it in the paper recently. That's in the Willits area, and they're occupied and uh, with Core support through grants and a lot of tech 
medical advising, we were able to convince them to that this could really be a model project, and they went that. Then, of course, the salt fist, and we provide ongoing support to them. Um, it's an income qualified program, and just a little antidote. When I I had a ski accident in February, and it was pretty, uh, it, was, it was pretty bad. Anyway, I was in the hospital, and uh, I was dealing with a, a a PT there, and I asked the woman where she lived, and she started to tell me that they had just gotten into the salt vista, and she started telling me all about the salt vista, how it was green and it was solar powered and they were so excited and they lived in the valley for 13 years and they finally found a place and I have to say it just made me feel so good to that we that core really helped direct that to become what it is today as a net zero project and so that was pretty exciting and then of course uh, the arts campus at Willis if you don't know it's one of the first performing arts center that will be net zero all electric that really started off with a conversation with the architect and Ryan Honey, uh, for RMI, and then Dave Monk, who also sits on the core board and the Holy Cross Energy Board, talking about how this could be net zero, and they embraced it. And they raised, for provided um, a grant to them, but they have raised all of the money to build this project and make it what it is today. And it's pretty exciting because they'll be going forward and holding events based on the fact that they that it is net zero so and then in existing buildings one of the efforts that we work in partnership with the city is historic preservation and there are 12 small lodges and we do a lot of advising and and provide funding some incentives to those small lodges to maintain them so that's how we invest the uh, grant dollars so in 2022, what we really want to do is expand our outreach for climate action and beneficial electrification. And we will be doing that through a number in a number of ways. And that's through some contractor outreach, through working with our communities, through regional climate action. As I mentioned, we're in the process of conducting the emissions inventories with Aspen, Picking County. Um, town of Assault in town of Sn and Snowmass Village. That this is the first regional climate uh, emissions inventory that we've done. We've all done them individually, but this will be a regional one. So that'll create more regional action. Um, what we'd like to do is work with you to develop the carbon reduction and resiliency strategy. That came up a, uh, about a month or two ago, I think during one of your discussions when you were adopting, you were either, I know, you were looking at uh, how you were gonna change, upgrade the boilers at the library. And I think that that was a conversation you all had about how do you look at all of your buildings holistically? And so uh, we thought this is an opportunity for or to provide some support to Pickett County with your staff to really develop a, a carbon reduction and resiliency strategy in large sense. We want to leverage regional partnerships to expand our impact. And I think this SCOLA project that we're completing is an opportunity. There's also opportunities by Feinerman, I think she's on, I saw her. She's been working with the communities to really bring everybody together and you know work individually with each community and then bring the communities together so we can leverage our regional partnerships. And, Working, we're still a part of Energy Smart Colorado. You may remember that. Some of you who've been on the board since 2010, that was formed, and that organization is still going, and and we're part of that. And we leverage those that partnership for information exchange and outreach ideas, other other ways as well. Uh, we also want to, as this relates to the second bullet, just really help identify paths to move the county away from fossil fuels. And, and this relates to looking, exploring uh, a, an alternative, a natural gas alternative, maybe a, a ramp specifically for natural gas, or looking at franchise agreements, Picking County, Town of Assault, Snemass Village all have franchise agreements with, uh, with Black News Energy, and you probably are aware that in Oregon, they recently renegotiated their franchise agreement with their 
natural gas company. And it looks like summers will be coming up in the next couple of years, so we can review those and figure out what might alternative, what alternatives might we incorporate into our franchise agreements. We just really need to start moving away from fossil fuels. That's bottom line. We're going to achieve the goals that that you all have adopted and that we need to achieve in order for um, to preserve our planet. Uh, we want to improve affordable housing with a focus on net zero. And in fact, we are having a conversation with APJA recently. I, I'm not sure which one of you is on the APJA board. Patty, are you still on the APJA board? No, it's Kelly and Francie. Okay. So we've been talking with them. They've been talking about how they want to um, get those homes inspected before they get sold. And what we want to do is incorporate an energy assessment in them so that when you're buying or selling a house, you'll know what the energy efficiency opportunities are. So that's just one strategy, but we also want to focus on more improving more affordable housing. And I uh, would like to see some work with mobile homes. There was a, there's been a pretty successful mobile home project in Eagle County that we'd like to replicate here and on our side of the hill. And uh, with a border, with um, mobile homes. So, and then again, we want to integrate electrification requirements into the building code. That's the next step. You all have spent a lot of time on building codes, and we have a, we actually meet with the building code officials. Oh, every quarter, I think it is, and talk about building codes and that, not all building codes, but the, I, the energy efficiency codes and how they can be made better, what kind of adoption rate they can be at so that everybody's kind of on the same track with maybe their little amendments. And then how do we really integrate electrification requirements into the building code? So as you know, CORE has been supporting better, you know, advancing building, ad adopting advanced building codes all um, along, but this is kind of that new phase of beneficial electrification. Then the other piece is that we want to really support architects and contractors to electrify all new homes because while we have really good building codes, goes to the bullet above, we need to make sure that those 10,000 square foot, 5,000, 12,000 square foot homes are really all, all electric. That's what they need to be. They should not have boilers in them anymore. And we know that architects and contractors need to understand that they're not, it sounds, uh, not so positive, but we want them to understand that that is a possibility and that is where we want to go and so that not only will they achieve the HERS ratings that the county has set, but they'll also be more of a net zero. Uh, and then we just want to continue to refine our programs to further decarbonize existing buildings because that's just, we have a lot of existing buildings around Pickham County and into Eagle County, where we work as well with in partnership with Eagle County. So we want to be able to do that. Um, we're always looking at what is the next way area that we need to push. So, and then by doing so, we want to catalyze more innovative projects like Chaka and the Salt Vista with our incentive and grants. And so we have a small, we'll continue a small grant program as long as we can and provide incentives because we've, we've had this conversation, we've talked a lot about whether we need incentives, whether we don't need incentives. And and you need that incentive, that financial incentive to get that person, get a person to that next hurdle. It's just going back to Stephanie Solner, I mean, she needed just that little bit of incentive to take that next leap and the advising, which helps. So, and then we want to target major carbon sources outside of the greenhouse gas inventories. and. As you probably know, uh, sources, carbon sources like uh, emissions from coal mines, either active or abandoned, natural gas wells, natural gas pipelines aren't really monitored as part of our emissions inventories. And what we have been working on recently, and I think Greg has updated you, is looking at Coal mine, uh, coal mine or methane emissions from uh, the coal mine in uh, Pickin County is coal. Gosh, I just can't believe that. I might just coal basin. Coal basin. Coal basin. Thank you. 
at, from Paul Redstone. Above looked, Redstone. Yeah. yeah, it's over by Redstone. We looked at um, a 2016 study that the Colorado Energy Office had done, and that actually was identified as an abandoned mine, and it, it shows that there's quite a bit of methane leakage there. And so we've been working with a fellow who's a um, uh, chemist, and he graduated from the Colorado School of Mines and has been looking at methane and have been exploring and gathering some information and some data about uh, at what's happening in Coal Basin. And, and it's interesting because that that one uh, has a lot of or it has a lot of potential leakage. And so we've been taking some equipment over there and walking it, and we're looking at doing a little bit more in-depth analysis and. It's actually getting some traction, some interest from the federal government in that uh, we're Senator Bennett's office and Senator Hickenlooper's office has got, understands the importance of capturing or targeting carbon sources like like mine mine emissions, and there's plenty of them around the country. I think there's something in the neighborhood of 640 some abandoned mines just in Colorado. And so it's something that we should be really looking at. And we've, we've taken the initiative to start looking at this, and we'll see what happens. And we'll come back to you with an update on that one. And then, again, just really focusing on 100% beneficial electrification. We've beneficial, we need to, you know, the mantra is electrify, electrify, electrify everything. And so that's where we're focusing our efforts. Um, and then we'll be, as I mentioned, transforming force funding and so that's what we're looking at, uh, how we are going to meet, continue to meet these challenges, these carbon challenges. We've been, you know, really tackling them for since 1994. So here's some highlights of our financial transition. Um, in 2020 and early 2021, we've started to look at new funding. So. We've uh, brought, brought on Eagle County as a funding partner when we drew back our um, territory. We um, started to look at uh, Eagle County as a potential funding partner for the basalt and unincorporated Eagle County area. The Colorado Energy Office has helped support some training for our Imagine Climate this past year. All of the funding came from outside funding. And then we've developed a new mo a new program model for fee for services, providing HERS, as well as the home energy rating system, um, and then also just doing some design work uh, for potential homeowners and, or home builders. And then we've also brought on a grant specialist as a new employee for. So in summary, I think we're requesting your support for half a million dollars. And um, we're focusing on a decrease of a thousand metric tons of CO2. And we'd, um, we'd like you to provide any support or feedback to develop a fully funded rent request. Okay, yeah. hey, do we have Steve yeah. back? Mm -hmm. Oh, there's Steve back. Okay, I'm not gonna say anything about your your internet connection, Steve. Nothing. I'm not going to say anything. Um, so, Steve or so Greg? Sorry. <laughs> I know. We were just brought out my internet connection, and I didn't realize my laptop had become unplugged, so oh. I lost my power. <laughs> <laughs> no. We thought maybe the battery um, in the van well, ran out. Go ahead, Steve. With, with your request, Mona, for the 500000 from Pitkin County, is, is that just for your projected budget? which yeah. is below this year's budget, uh, why don't you ask for more money to try to maintain the 2021 budget? I think Cindy's going to well, res Wait, Mona, I think Cindy's <laughs> like going to respond. Yeah. Steve, um, I worked with Connie looking at our uh, funding through RAMP, and the 500,000 is about the maximum that we would be able to support CORE um, at this point in time. We can always look as we get closer to 2022, but right now that would be about the maximum that we could support the CORE efforts, given the fact that we are 
finding that we have a lot of rebates um, going back to uh, homeowners who are putting solar or other uh, energy saving techniques in their home to meet the code. And on top of that, we have fewer uh, core dollars coming in because of our um, new energy codes. So we have the responsibility of ensuring that we have the money to pay back to the homeowner if they request a refund prior to their certificate of occupancy. So you, so, you meant clean, rent monies, not core monies coming back. Um, rent monies. Rent monies. Thank okay. you. So, Steve, go ahead. Okay, then a follow-up question on that. Um, what are the possibilities, and maybe this is where the grant applications come into effect, but what are the possibilities of getting money from the federal infrastructure uh, <laughs> effort that is going on right now to fund all of our program, perhaps? Well, we certainly are exploring that. And so we're looking at how CORE can tap into those funds that um, that will be available through the feds and through the state as well. I think that's why you hired a new employee that's going to help you with grants, which is a wise thing yeah. to do. Yes. Yeah. And also, we'll be exploring foundations and individual donations as well. Okay. Steve, did you have anything else? Okay. Greg. Yeah, great. Thank you. Thanks, Mona. Um, every time I see this, it gets better and better. And I really appreciate the work you put into it. And Cindy, your input, I know. Um, I think we're getting closer, we're getting better. Uh, the things that I notice when you're talking and going down these lists. Um, I think of these specifics that have come up in our board meetings at CORE regarding such things as, uh, as you're talking about getting the contractors and the architects online on up to speed with heat pumps versus your typical radiant heat systems. Um, and uh, and one, I remember one great conversation came up about training the contractors themselves, the workers who have always done it a certain way and that's the way they do it. And they'll they might even give lip service. Oh, yeah, we're going to do this the you know the best way. But the fact is, they really do need some training. We we do need to do some education and, and training. And I think CORE could play a great role in that in making our our local contractors and workforce comfortable with things like heat pumps. So it becomes part of the discussion. Uh, I've been told over and over again by uh, people doing this work that um, everybody will say they know how to do something. You know, whether it's coming about putting in a new boiler system or replacing a boiler, they all say they know how to do it. But when it comes down to it, you need to make sure we've got the best trained engineers and contractors who really have some experience and know uh, what it's going to take to make these things work. And then they do work. Otherwise, you get uh, you get lip service. So CORE really has an outreach mission, um, a continuing outreach mission. And, and I honestly, just since I've been the, the, the rep to the board, have been impressed by um, you know, how that's progressing. And, and this presentation, I think, is an example of that. Uh, I like where it's going. And of course, um, I'm sure the other board members are going to want to see the presentation. So I'm sure we'll see you again soon. Mm -hmm. um, and there will be more. But the specifics, like I loved, I, I was the one who filmed that little thing with Stephanie Soldner. But she is so effusive about how, how CORE has really helped her uh, on their with their mission to create Soldner Center, which is going to be a, an amazing public asset uh, in the community, and we'll hear more about that too. So um, the other thing I wanted to bring up was uh, just regarding uh, you know policy. You know how do we how do we move policy to make sure that that mobile homes have the best uh, insulation and energy technology available, and that we're not putting in ancient uh, legacy systems that will be heat pigs or energy pigs. Um, and, the, and the same with, um, you know, somebody building a new house, if they do it, as you said, the cheap way, they may be putting in really wasteful appliances and wasteful uh, uh, radiant heat systems when we could be telling them, sorry, you're, you know, heat pumps are the way to go. And, and on that last note, just want to say my heat pump that I installed a couple of years ago works down to, I think, 13 degrees below zero. It will still pull energy from the atmosphere and heat my home. And, and uh, it's just remarkable. I'm still in awe of it. And I, I haven't mentioned to my wife that it's actually an air conditioner also 
So it just doesn't work in the <laughs> summer and hasn't really needed to yet. But uh, the fact is it's, it's an amazing uh, home heating device. Thank you. So, it, it, Mona, could you go back to the slide you had that showed what you, you needed from us and had, like, I think, yep. three bullet points? So, um, yeah. as far as an interim update, I think if in late summer, I think if something changes significantly, then definitely. Um, and we know you'll be back for the budget presentation in the fall, which is when the board will actually consider this officially. And we'll see what the REMP um, program fund numbers are. And um, and I uh, I don't think I need anything else to support this except to see what you come back with. Um, if you know there's some surprising change to the positive in the summer, and then we'll see what happens in the fall. So um, I am extremely impressed that you have this together so early in the season, for which I am greatly appreciative of because then we don't get hit with everything from the budget. At the same time, this allows us to have a little more time and conversation, which I think is beneficial to everyone. Hey, Greg? Patty, can I, can yes. I add, just add that, uh, Mona, if you're able to, to talk to Francie and, and Kelly, at least in the interim, um, just to make sure if there are any red flags or anything that needs to be addressed to make sure that we're not missing an opportunity if, if they do need more um, as we go into budget season, I just want to make sure you're um, you know, Cindy and, and Mona are, you know, fully, fully able to, to press forward with this as we go forward. But I, I certainly am supporting it as the core rep. I support it. Um, but I want to make sure if there are any if there are any questions from them, let's get that taken care of before the next opportunity right. is missed for the presentation. And Greg, we can also ask Thanks. them if they'll tune in and watch this section of our meeting, too. I think that would be beneficial for both of them. But on another note, Mona, before we leave, um, Stotts Mill, do we have any involvement, does CORE have any involvement with what's happening with Stotts Mill, which is, you know, the big project just below Basalt Vista, between Basalt Vista and Southside? Um, I don't know if we do or not. That I, Sorry, Marty would know that question. If you could find out, because that's going to be a huge residential development. It's got great exposure, as does Basalt Vista, and it might be a great opportunity to see them follow suit with what we did just up the street. Yeah. Great. I'll, I'll follow up with that. Do great. you know who the developer is, or is that the developer's thoughts? No, I don't know who the developer is. I drove by it going to Basalt Vista the other day, and I just realized that they're they're just kind of moving dirt around. I don't know if there's even curbs and gutters. I don't know what infrastructure they've put in yet. So um, it would be great if they were going all electric. But yeah, just, Patty, yeah. if, oh, if, if I could, I, uh, Mona mentioned uh, that we were, the governor was at the Salt Vista last week. Patty was there with me. We And uh, it was really great to hear him talk about how the Salt Vista was, this is like the moonshot. It's the successful moonshot to demonstrate that we can do net zero, energy positive, affordable housing. And and he was super enthusiastic about it, and he could tell that we are as well. And there is talk about doing more, of course. And, you know, there's another project in Rifle. I'm wondering if maybe the tree farm property and, you know, the Forest Service land, uh, if that ever turns into housing with basalt, that could be something on our radar. Um, but anyway, the, the thing that uh, I did want to mention here is the unsung hero for Pitkin County, of course, uh, is John Peacock, who came in early on on making Basalt Vista happen uh, and, and with our participation. And John, I want, I'm want i sorry you weren't there. We mm -hmm. probably would have uh, recognized you had you been. Otherwise, I think people are coming up to me and congratulating me. And it, it didn't feel right. And I realized it's because you're the one who did the groundwork and the heavy lifting. And, and uh, so anyway, just wanted to make sure that people understand how big a role John played in that and and let's keep doing it let's do it again how long did it take to really negotiate good. that three-party agreement that took a long time to negotiate and and thank you Greg and of course it, it doesn't happen without um, you know leadership and agreement from the board so um, that was a, that was a great project to be part of and so uh, glad to play a role in it. It gets greater every time we go down there. It just, it's, it, it is amazing. And that's why it would be great to see if Stott's Mill down the street would at least take some, some guidance from a project just up the hill. 
So let's well, see what we can do. Hopefully, now that we have this one under our belt, we can figure out how to do some more like it. Yeah, we got some more lined up. So, so does the city. We can yep. work on that. All right. Anything else, Mona? Did you have anything last closing or Cindy? I don't, other than just thank you for your time and for your support and your feedback. I appreciate that. So. And you are healing well or well healed by now? Good girl. Yep. I just got back from a week long bike trip. I didn't ride every day. Okay. <laughs> Be careful out there. All right. Anything else from Steve or Greg? Nope. Okay. Thanks. We're going to be moving along. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. So next, um, John, where would you like us to go? Because we have board interviews, but I don't, oh, we've got Lisa McDonald, but I don't know if we have Lisa and John, or we could do future agendas. We've got like a half an hour. Well, if Lisa if Lisa is on now, I'm not seeing everyone's faces. Do you see Lisa McDonald point. or John Ely? No. So why don't we go to future agendas? Shall we kick that out? Yeah, and I'm, I am going. To, we're we're doing a software change, which is requiring me to remember a password that I have not had to remember in a really long time so i would you like a copy <laughs> in paper I, I will take notes but i don't have anything uh um without my electronic memory right now so does the board mind if i start off because you know me and my list of future agendas so first it's, and i'm going to look at steve child um or maybe for the cc4ca policy statements or maybe cindy um, can we have those before the meeting on the 13th so we can review them before we have our discussion? Sure. Um, I think Kelly was handling that, but I will. Okay, if you can follow up, because I, I think it would save us time if we have a chance to review them so we're not trying to catch up at the meeting. Um, and then on the 20th, John, which is a work session, I am going to be out of town and. Um, Steve will still be in Alaska and hopefully have good internet, but if not, I just want you to know I may or may not be able to zoom into that meeting. Depends on uh, circumstances with my mom. I will be leaving town on the 17th and returning sometime late on the 26th. So, um, and then on the 29th is our EOTC meeting, which I'm assuming there were no times listed on the agenda. I'm assuming it's four to six. So we just need to add those times to the agenda. And then on the 28th, um, another just a heads up, it's when Pandora, Cindy, comes back to the Board of Commissioners. Steve will still be out of town, and I, I have to recuse. That will be re-published um, and all for the 25th of August. Okay. Just so I want to make sure we have a quorum, yeah, and I didn't want the ski company to be aware that there may only be three commissioners on that meeting. You're but now it's going to be moved to August, so. Yes. Yeah. And I want to clarify again while I have an opportunity that I still need to recuse because the ski company brought this application in as one master plan, not two separate issues. So I'm getting calls. I got some more about my being able to vote on just Pandora's, which the county attorney, attorney has advised me that, no, I cannot. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I think that... Um, I think that's all I have for our upcoming future agendas. Does anybody else? Steve, go ahead, please. He's on mute. Steve, you're on mute. There you go. I can't see the screen that well, the little red thing, the line. Anyhow, on the, the 28th of July, it's it does have Pandora, but then I also had heard through the publicity by the group advocating for the Pandora project about the August 25th date, and I wanted clarification. I presume this is going to be more than one meeting to go through it all because they're going to have to present everything to us uh, with Francie being brand new. It's all going to be brand new information to her. So I think that it probably will take them two meetings, but why, what is actually happening on the 20, August 25th date versus the July 28th date? That will be the full presentation um, to the board. On the 25th. On the August 
meeting, which I believe is the 25th, um, whatever your regular board meeting is. Um, so that will be that the will beginning be of that, Steve, where we will uh, begin all over again, because you're right, we wanted to uh, republish um, because it's been so long, two years, since the board heard the presentation and um, a lot has been changed, a lot has happened, and um, I think both the county attorney's office and ComDev felt like we needed to re republish everything and start, start from scratch. So does that mean that the July 28th is not happening at all, or are they gonna start the presentation on that date? No, it will not be happening at all. Okay, okay. And I, I mean, I, I plan on being at all our, all of our meetings. Um, and there could be, if I have trouble with Zoom sometime, I might have to just phone in and be, you know, on the audible part, but not on the Zoom part of a call is a backup option for me at any time. Okay. Daddy? Yes, Greg, please. Uh, on that topic, uh, since the, uh, the master plan came as one unit. We, the board has voted on the first half of it. Is there any way that can be separated or would the applicant actually consider that? Just wondering, since we're kind of starting there. over, it's not a question for Patty as much as it might be for Cindy or for John Ely, but I'm just wondering if that's been part of their, uh, have they been contemplating, is, there, is it possible to do that or would that require uh, you know, some sort of reset that they don't want to do. You're talking about the SKIKO master plan or you're talking about the East of Aspen master plan? Ski company master plan. Well, yes, I'm trying, I'm trying to figure out how to separate them because it sounds as if Patty has to remain recused right. because the process has already begun with her recusal. Should I step out? Um, but I'm just wondering if, if is, you know, it's a, it's a question I'd, I'd love to have the answer to, but maybe that's a John Eaton question. I think we'll need to talk with Ryan and John Ely more. Okay, Steve, Steve, go ahead. So as I remember, Greg, we did separate the question. It was like a Robert's Rules of Order procedure. I remember we did something where we separated the two and then we, that allowed us to vote on the master plan part and allowed them to continue the Pandora part. Steve and Greg, I think uh, this- That's my recollection, yeah. but then John Ely can confirm what what exactly yeah. we did. So let's wait, to, let's, let's wait to further discuss this till we have an opinion from the county attorney's office. Either that or I'm mm -hmm. gonna have to right. leave the room. I just realized that, Patty, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> if, Patty, if Patty leaves the room at all falls Oh uh, yeah, if I leave the room, the we're done, so. Okay, so any other future agendas before us? No. Do I, do we have John Ely on? Because I know John wanted to join Lisa. Is he coming, Lisa? He's supposed to be on. Okay. Yeah, he's he's coming. Connie Baker is coming, and Bill Yoakum is coming. So I think we were set for about three fifteen. So they might be okay. you know, just waiting a little We've bit. We've got so. more we can do. So let's move to okay. um, open discussion. Open discussion. Um, the uh, main issue I had for you for open discussion is that we do have an upcoming vacancy on the APSHA board. Uh, it's, uh, our, and I'm trying to remember who's going off right now. Let me pull up the email here. Um, at any rate, it is a joint appointment um, between the Board of County Commissioners and the City Council. Um, how we did this last time, this is a, a process question for the board, is when we redrafted the IGA, it was with the intent that the um, council and board um, would review applicants and act together uh, to make an appointment to the APSHA board, and we did the uh, interviews uh, together. And so, wanted to get some input from the board uh, about how you'd like to proceed uh, with, with filling this vacancy. Uh, the city council is also going to be uh, having a, a similar conversation, um, but we could plan for interviews, for example, at a, a joint meeting of the, the board and council. 
Have we had anybody apply? Uh, I do not know where we stand on the applications right now or how many we have. Well, I, I think having Kelly and Francie, since they sit on the board, would be key to this discussion. Mm-hmm. But Greg or Steve, do you have any position on how we want to fill this position? Steve? I think it would be uh, expedite the process if we could do the interview as a joint meeting. So the person only has to be interviewed once. Uh, we might ask different kind of questions in two different meetings, which perhaps could be beneficial. Yeah, the the only thing is, is trying to get all of us together to do one interview might be take longer than just interviewing the person separately. But Greg, what do you think? Um, yeah, getting a joint meeting together may be tough. Um, I I don't have a thought on that yet, but I, I'll put my head to it. I can think of, you know, people I'd be interested, not particularly personalities, but just uh, skill sets that I'd love to, <laughs> to propose bringing on to the APTA board, but I don't have anything to add okay. to it right now. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to think about that. So let's run it by Kelly and Francie too, John. Yeah, we can run it by. And, and as you all are processing, I think one of the reasons that we tried to do it jointly too is easier for the applicants, for the volunteers, yeah. uh, than scheduling two separate times for interviews. But I don't know if I'd want to be interviewed that'll by be, both boards be at the same time. That'll be the easiest thing the applicant ever goes through. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> 10 people <laughs> interviewing you at board. one time. Yeah, that'd be really fun. I w- I'd want that position in a heartbeat. Um, okay, so we'll we'll wait and see. We'll get some input from Francie and Kelly, and we'll probably be bringing it back okay. next Tuesday. John, did you have anything else for That's open? Yeah. Um, I know, Steve, you wanted to talk about the email we got from Mr. Lusk about the dust coming off the solar. Um, I pulled up the photographs, and um, I expected to see, like, plumes of oil and gas rig dust blowing up and down the valley. Um there was some significant dust, but something I think that can be easily mitigated, and I think we have environmental health as, you know, I think Kurt Dahl was queued in, and he was out of town. I think he should be back now. Right. We, um, we have it scheduled for July 13th to come before the board and do an update on the permit and all the conditions of approval. Oh, thank you. Um, I don't know if anybody could hear all that. We have um, we heard you. a meeting okay, scheduled. And so we'll come back with all of the conditions of approval, both Leslie Lamont, who is the planner, and Kurt Dahl with Environmental Health will come back and talk about those conditions okay. and what's happening with the project. So okay. just update everybody. So, Steve, does that answer you? Yeah. Greg? Greg, go ahead. Then, I would Steve. just add that I, I see the same plumes and I photograph them occasionally and I encourage Stuart because he sends them to me and I said, sure, just if you see one, take a picture of it and send it to me. I, um, it's great documentation of the of the whole process. And and if he's willing to do that, um, the thing I've noticed is in the, in the mornings, of course, those plumes blow up valley and they really don't come anywhere near people in, in inhabited areas and they're not significant. It's not like a, an awful lot of dust, as Patty said. Um, I haven't seen them in the afternoons. I haven't seen an issue where they're approaching the, the inhabited areas. Um, so I have to say, I, I, while I do appreciate, appreciate his concern, and I do think we should be mitigating however they can with watering or whatever, um, I don't see a, an, a, a huge issue yet. But I'd leave that to Kurt Dahl to, to make the conclusion on that. All right. Steve, did you want to add? Go ahead, Steve. So when I looked at the photograph, to me, it looked like it was diesel exhaust from the drill, the drilling or whatever they're, well, I don't know exactly what they're doing over there. It's something to do with either drilling holes or maybe it's rock dust that is the plume that's going in the air. Can you tell, Greg, from where? I, I think it's just York? the accumulated uh Dirt. It's, it's, it looks like just a, light, a fine uh, dust because it kind of hangs in the air for a bit, um, and, and I don't think it's rock. I think it's. Uh, I don't think there is rock where they're drilling. Um, I don't think they're going that low. So it didn't seem to be. Um, you know, if they have to do thirteen thousand holes or whatever it is to get every panel, then you know certainly we need to be on top of it. But from what I've seen so far, I think it's a little bit of. It's almost like the surface fine dust that blows around. 
and they're kicking some of that up. Maybe a little bit of water on the solution could take care of that. Yeah, and I think they're still doing pilot holes. So that's what I was thinking on the 13th, we could bring that up if, if Pert Dahl or somebody doesn't talk to them in the meantime, and maybe they just need to have, shoot a little water in there and to cut the dust down while they're doing a hole. Okay. Might be the entire solution. C Cindy's got a comment here, gentlemen. Yeah, um, Kurt can go into it in more detail, but he did send us an email saying that given the, um, the use of the property before and the regulations that the sand district is held to, you cannot add water to the mixture when you're drilling down into um, the area. And they're only, Greg, I think going six feet down. Uh, I think you're right about the type of dust and they're not hitting rock. Um, so I think, you know, Kurt can answer a lot of your questions. Because you don't want to, you don't want to dilute the soil into the into the surface water or groundwater. <laughs> Apparently that's the reason. Yeah. So, so it'll come back on the 13th in one way or another, just maybe a memo or maybe a full discussion. So John will look at getting Kurt some time then on that. Any other open, Steve, open discussion other than that? Yeah, there was another email from a neighbor of mine up the road from my house. She lives beyond the part where the county traditionally does routine maintenance. So the county road crews are up there right now doing the, you know, the road grading, the rolling and putting mag chloride on up to a certain point on the county road. Um, this family has a new baby and they live just beyond there on the steep part where the road starts going up towards the Capitol Creek trailhead. Uh, and she asked if it was possible if the county could do a mag chloride treatment on the road right by her house because it's this fine dust, road dust that gets kicked up every car. And right now it's becoming, you know, it's the season for people to start going up to Capitol Peak. And uh, so there's a lot of traffic by there. Uh, I think she already talked talk to people at, in the road and bridge. I think she talked to Scott Matice about it, but, um, and I guess that's what I would suggest is we need to find out more information from Scott Matice about where does the county officially quit doing the routine maintenance. My, I always thought that the part, the steeper part was part of the forest service maintenance of the road that the county actually does that but a, a different level of treatment and a much less frequently than they do the annual maintenance on the you know on the main part of the county road so i think i personally would need more information on it um got it but it's something it would be something i think scott matice or brian pettit probably would be able to answer a lot of the, the questions for us so maybe we could get an update on that at our next meeting. John, if you could follow up on that. I don't I don't know if you received that email. I, I didn't from, yeah, I didn't see anything, but the only concern would I'll, be if there are I will I will find it and forward it to uh, send it to John and then send it to Charlotte to get okay. to Yeah, the only thing uh, all is the commissioners. Steve, if they're already doing the work up there, I don't know if we'd be able to add this to their plan right now but maybe it's something for future discussion but yeah if we could get more information for our next meeting and even if it's just a memo we'd be fine anything else Steve okay Greg um, yeah just um, you know in passing I'm sure all of you have heard about the there there's an, inf an inflation in TDR value that's pretty shocking um, and I remember bringing up the, the, the hoping that we're, we, we would schedule a, a work session on, on TDRs and how we employ them and use them um, uh, sometime in the future. So I just want to put that as, you know, flag, keep the flag flying for that uh, to get on a future agenda. Um, enough about that for now. I think Cindy's got a comment. Greg, I thought that the board had decided that we were going to roll that in with all of the other discussions on growth management since it's a part of 
that discussion, so I don't have it scheduled now. If there's other direction, I need to know. Yeah, and that's. I, I don't think we're in an emergency situation, but it, it's just uh, it's just front and center in my mind, and and um, you know, looking forward to that conversation. The one thing the board did ask us to do is a greater dive, a deeper dive into growth management um, because we do have newer members that don't, haven't had the history with the growth management um, process and the quota system and, you know, the context, how it came about and all of that. So I have that scheduled for July 26th and so maybe we can bring up some of that then. That's okay. great. That would be that would be great. Thanks, Cindy. Okay. Okay. Any other open discussion? Seeing none, I'm going to um, see. Do we have John Ely on this meeting yet, or should we take a 10 minute break and see if we can get John on board and Connie? Hey, Patty, I do have one more short quick thing um, just because it's on the front and center right now with all those closures in Glenwood Canyon we're definitely seeing more activity and in, in uh, on Highway 82 and Independence Pass I know they've managed to stop probably several semis um, um, I actually alerted the sheriff to one myself the other day um, but I also know we've had some closures because of stuck semis on the Independence Pass and and so I, I, I just want to make sure the public understands we are doing as much as we can about that. And if, John, you want to add anything, but I've had people ask me like, well, why aren't you guys posting a sheriff or a gate or a, I say, well, I think we do have vigilance there. Um, because when that, when the, when Independence Pass gets shut down, the economic Im impact for that, it would be pretty daunting to calculate and it would be pretty high, I think. Uh, you know, to have a, a road like that closed this time of year changes a lot of people's travel plans. Um, John, anything you yeah, can add? Yeah, and Greg, as, as we do have time, uh, both uh, CDOT and Colorado State Patrol have also been partnering with us to, to try and have resources at both sides of the pass. Uh, unfortunately, um, you know, the, the especially with the rains, um, which were really excited to be getting but it hasn't been very predictable uh, those resources haven't always been able to I, I think be at, at both sides of, of, of the pass in a, in a timely fashion so um, we certainly are uh, working with our, our partners also in the city of Aspen uh, through the sheriff's department uh, department of transportation and uh, highway patrol to, to really try and, and limit that um, but it is a lot of volume, uh, and as you've said, uh, we have had some get through, uh, sometimes on the Lake County side, sometimes on our side, uh, that, that have caused some uh, closures or lane closures, particularly at those tight spots that, that we all know so well. So we are, we are continuing to work on it. Steve? The other night when we drove um, over Independence Pass, when the canyon was closed, we needed to get to the airport. There was, on both sides of the pass, on ours and Lake County side, there was a vehicle parked at the final turnaround point with a flashing light going. It was a fire truck actually sitting over on the Lake County side. Uh, then there was a law enforcement vehicle pour, pulling over a semi like at one o'clock in the morning the other, the other night on the Lake County side, who was just approaching the final turnaround, some big, huge semi was trying to get over there. So they are doing their part on the Lake County side, too. I was really pleased mm -hmm. to see that. And trucks are trying to go over there. I saw other trucks down on the main highway, like towards Leadville, who appeared to be turning around and going back. They, they Somehow they figured out they're not going to be able to go that way. They need to change their plan. So I, there are a lot of trucks in funny locations uh, trying to get going the right direction because they, they, we don't want them coming over independence for sure. Yeah, there, there is an action plan in, in place, um, particularly after we had the uh, uh, first kind of unplanned closure because of accidents uh, on the pass the, the first time we, we had the rains. 
Gosh, I guess that was just last summer, wasn't it? Um, it was actually the fire, when the fire and the... Oh, it's the Grizzly Creek fire. The, mm-hmm. Thank you. Yes, mm-hmm. uh, we're still suffering from the Grizzly Creek fire mm-hmm. in that regard. Um, and and our partners have been doing a good job uh, following through as they can. And like I said, it's the, the short notice is sometimes hard to respond to. Um, people get up there quicker. I wish we had space where we could not only find them, we could impound their truck for... 24 48 hours because that's a big hit to truck drivers that's why they don't want to go the long way because they want to take the short route and 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 it's just it's just a public safety issue besides the economic impact issue so yeah it's pretty significant okay can we take 10 and then come back at three o'clock and hopefully we'll have everybody we'll have connie on board and we'll be ready to go with the healthy rivers and streams does that work Okay, grassroots, we're going to take 10. Because John's here, we just wanted to... safe and happy 4th of July. So we are continuing the Board of Commissioners regular or work session meeting. Uh, Steve Child is calling in from Alaska. We appreciate that. Greg is at home. I am in the building. Kelly's on an airplane and Francie's in Denver. So it's a very interesting group here today. So next item on our agenda is Healthy Rivers and Streams request to add a full-time employee and we have John Neely from the Attorney's Office. We have Lisa McDonald from Healthy Rivers and Stream. We have Connie Baker from Budget. Or I don't know what title you have these days, Connie, but Connie is the one who knows where all the money is coming from and going to. And we have Bill Yokums who sits on the Healthy Rivers and Streams board. So Lisa, please, we've been waiting for this conversation, so the floor is yours. <laughs> good, well, good afternoon, everybody, um, and thanks, Nadi. As Patty mentioned, um, today I'm joined by John Ely, our county attorney, Connie Baker, our budget director, and Bill Yokums is here. He is our vice chair, um, chairman of our Healthy Rivers and Streams board. And I just wanted to note that Greg Poshman was one of our originals, along with Phil, on um, the Healthy Rivers board. So we appreciate all of his work. Um, so in front of you today for discussion is a request for a full-time staff position for the Healthy Rivers program. Uh, the program has seen exponential growth in the past 12 years since its inception, and there's a, di- a desire to further the breadth of the program, and current staffing is inadequate to do so. Um, I've included in the agenda item summary um, our projects, efforts, and work um, that we have accomplished to date, and although the list is extensive, um, I think I've probably missed a few things. But I wanted to really showcase um, all the hard work that the um, program and um, board has accomplished since its 12 years. Um, 
And so to realize the full potential of the program, we are seeking a specialist to assist with current duties and devise new strategies and in-house projects. I did include um, a glimpse of just one construction project um, entails, and I think we are at approximately four construction projects with Whitewater Park, the modifications, and um, the current, the, the wrap-up of the Robinson project um, that we just finished. Um, so I'll just give a little um, synopsis of what happened at the um, Robinson project. So approximately two years prior to um, construction, we held numerous BOCC meetings, river board meetings, and stakeholder meetings, and sought grant opportunities um, that we thought were appropriate for the type of project that we were doing. Um, we applied for three grants, and we also received, we were awarded those three grants. Um, grant applications included presentations in front of the grantors in three different locations across the state. I think in Denver, one in Southern Colorado, and one, I think, a little north of Denver. So that includes, you know, driving to presentations, getting there, presenting, and um, all of that. So... Um, upon award of a grant, um, administration required deliverables, reporting, and request for reimbursements are also needed. Um, the CWC, um, CWCB grant awards required um, reports every few months, and so um, it just kind of gives you an idea of everything that goes in just to, to one grant, let alone three. Um, then requests for proposals are put out to bid. Um, solicitations um, come in. We have to draft all the documents for those bids, which include contracts, tech specs, plans, bid tabs. Everything is put online. A selection company or committee is gathered. Scoring and award of the contract occurs, um, and construction then begins. On-site construction management happens. We do most of our work in the winter, as you know, and um, we are always concerned about um, ice flows. Every every project we've done, we've had ice flow warnings and um, some issues, and so we have to keep in constant contact with the contractors down there to make sure everybody stays safe. Um, should something happen, that could be uh, devastating down there. So. Um, um, On-site construction happens. We drafted three different license and use agreements and executed those with three different landowners around the property at Robinson. Um, we applied for four different permits with four different permitting agencies, including FEMA, the Army Corps, which we work with CPW with, Town of Assault, and Eagle County. The project was right on the Eagle County and Town of the Salt Mine, so we worked with both of those local um, municipalities um, for the work. We held meetings with landowners prior and after the construction project completion and with other local government entities prior and after construction as well. With COVID, we had to develop a construction COVID construction plan we created an, an informational signage because there was a it's a popular walking spot so people were wondering what was going on out there so we had signs up so um, that answered a lot of questions we did social media posts we did photography we did drone fitted footage we did media requests um a lot of the you know a couple of the papers wanted to come down and check things out so we arranged all of that with the contractors um so all of this and more just went into one um, construction project. And I wanted to um, go through like the, the list that's in your um, packet about the projects and efforts that we've done to date. Um, I won't read everything out, but um, I wanted to come kind of uh, go through a few of them. Um, we did the Stapleton Brothers Ditch Water Trust Agreement with the CWCB. We did geomorphic assessments out at North Star. We had a successful opposition in the West Divide case. Um, we partnered with Luwapo with the Invasive Species Program. We have the popular Osprey Cam. Um, and we developed the Youth Water Leadership Summit with Wild Rose Education, which had a total of 375 students um, participating in that. 
We've held public educational meetings, and we are hoping to gear those up again after COVID. Those included speaker series. We did a drug take back day. That included um, putting little postcards on all the prescriptions throughout all the local um, pharmacies in the valley. We participate in the Penny Hot Springs Committee, and um, we try to attend the QP meetings, Basin Roundtable meetings, and collaborate with um, and collaborated and funded um, part of the Roaring Fork Watershed um, Plan. We provide public comment letters and letters of support to numerous entities. We support. We are now supporting local efforts on the wild and scenic designation of the Crystal River. Um, we issue Ryan Fork Watershed High School students um, scholarships. We received over 40 scholarships over the last few years and awarded 11 scholarships. We have education and training for the board and staff. We've attended 78 conferences, workshops, and educational meetings to further um, enhance the education. We provide sponsorships for 23 different events, including Think Outside the Banks, it was a landscaping um, seminar we did. We provide um, sponsorship for the Headwaters Magazine, Water Leaders Education Programs in Redstone. We provided um, funding for the Ask with, for Aspen Global Change Institute um, Weather and Soil Moisture Science Kits, um, Citizen Science Kits. We have a biannual grant program that we've awarded 42 projects um approximately 741,000 in funding um so that's just a little bit of what we do <laughs> um i think that i spelled out a little bit more in um in your packet so that's just a quick showcase of um the great program that we have and the great work that we do and um i think with that i might turn it over to john Ely. if you have any questions then Kanye is here to answer me budget or fund information you might have. So John, before you start, I have a question for Lisa. When you say we, who's the we in we, Lisa? <laughs> Me? Okay, I just wanted to clarify Well, I mean, the, the, board is, the board does a lot, you know, but I mean, all the administration, all of this um, falls on, on me right now. Okay, thank you. John, did you have anything yeah. you wanted to add? Well, um, for perspective, I guess I would point out to the board something that everybody already knows, and that is that the, the world of water is a very competitive place. And as, tr as hard as we try to collaborate um, with other entities, many times self-interest on the part of other parties um, tend to, um, well, invade that collaborative process. And about oh, 2006 or so, the county started to perceive that that was a significant problem. And we decided collectively, and when I say we, I mean the BOCC at that time, decided that it was improvident to rely upon others to have our back in this arena. And uh, by 2008, that issue came to a head with the authorization by the voters to support this program with a dedicated sales tax. I think that um, all of the information in your packet relates to the idea that over the life of this program and the imposition of this tax, the county has successfully established for itself an individual and unique voice in this world of water that we have continually looked for creative solutions to problems, that we have continually sought to advance the needs of the Upper Roaring Fork, the, the Frying Pan River, and the Crystal River, and that we have done so in a way to be as collaborative as possible with other entities and other uh, water stakeholders in the Roaring Fork drainage and the Western Colorado. So, the reality of it is, is that we've got a program here that has done a lot of a program that has accomplished a lot and that is on the verge of expanding and growing more and is capable of doing much more than 
we've already done. And it's ready to take that next step. And um, with that is the need for personnel. Lisa can't do this by herself. It's just In fact, it's a three-person program. So after you guys approve this position today, we're going to have to start thinking about a third individual. So um, I would ask the board to wholeheartedly support this position so that the program can continue to grow, so that we can continue to look for and develop uh, fresh ideas to water conservation and preservation enhancement of stream flows in our watershed. Uh, and we can continue to grow this program and to grow Pickens Voice. Um, now that's about all I have to say on this particular request. Okay, thank you, John. Connie, I'm going to look at you if you wanted to add, add any budgetary because I know that is a key point in this request. Yes, so the board will remember that in the 2021 budget process, this was one of the positions that was proposed. At that time, uh, it was not recommended right away, but we put it on a, our list of pending positions, meaning that we felt it needed uh, a little bit more time to uh, flesh out and bring back to the board for discussion, but it was not a rejected position. It was one that we let the board know ahead of time we would be bringing back mid-year in 2021. Uh, the, the estimated dollar amounts are shown there in your packet, and. The Healthy Rivers Fund does have a, a very healthy fund balance and has enough funding to fully support this position ongoing. Great. Thanks, Connie. I have a question about the tax itself. Is it a perpetual? Is there, there's no sunset on this sales tax. Is that correct? Okay. It's a perpetual Great. tax and has no limitation. Great. So Thanks. it will grow with sales tax revenue. Great. Thank you. Does the board have any questions for Connie or Lisa at this time? Steve? So um, if we add this a new, a new full-time position, and Lisa, I'm not sure how much of your, what percentage of your time is spent on the, the water issues and what percentage of your time is spent on other issues, but will you continue kind of at the same percentage of doing some water things I mean, I'm assuming there would be a different person. I mean, the person, full-time water person might be you, and we might hire somebody else to replace you, what you're doing now on your other matters. I, I want to get a better feel for, you know, that division of labor for the responsibilities. The, the problem, Steve, is that uh, Lisa's time uh, adds up to like 110 or 120 percent, and that's a possible. That's an impossibility. So she'll be 100 uh, percent um, um, in the uh, the river program and administering that program. Okay. Greg, did you have anything? So John, then then we would have another person. We'd hire another person who would be doing. Some river things, but other other uh, legal matters unrelated to that. Is that is that what you're envisioning? Um, the legal matters. Well, I'll tell you what. You can't do anything in uh, in this world of water without uh, good engineering and without legal assistance. We have legal assistance in house, and I think that that's the most economical uh, way to go. Um, but I think um, what the program needs, and why I mentioned it as a a three-person program is you need somebody to take care of the the day-to-day -day scheduling and the um, and the administration work and the, uh, uh, the the correspondence and scheduling and all that kind of stuff. You need somebody who can um, um, be the program director, which is what Lisa's default function has been for the last few years. Uh, and then you need somebody to assist and be uh, immediately available. Um, from the, the uh, perspective of an engineer or hydrologist who can work with the, the director and, and this new newly created position for today to try to develop new programs, to try to think of new ideas, to try to develop new relationships with people that we can work with to accomplish the program's goals. In other words, to protect water actually flowing over rocks in natural stream channels. Um, so that's 
that's how I would see the program growing and, and what the real needs of the program are. Until it fills out with the, the three bodies, so to speak, um, what we're forced to do is hire out uh, for outside consulting work with um, other engineering firms or hydrologist firms. So, so what you're saying then is we would be hiring a new person Lisa and the new person both would be 100% working on water matters at this time. And then we would still be shorthanded for some of the things we need to do. Well, if we had, I think if the program had three people at 100%, we would be, we would be swimming right along, so to speak. If, um, uh, you know, we have this, into, uh, this position filled. Um, uh, Lisa working 100%, and then someone with the, uh, the experience and expertise of, of in hydrology or engineering. Um, I, I think that would be a, an intact complement that would serve the program well. Okay, Greg, and then I'm going to turn to Bill to see if he wants to add. I'm, it's just amazing to see what's been accomplished. And, and, and John, you're right, the founding the Healthy Rivers Fund has, was, has been such a great benefit to the community. And I think other communities are watching uh, with admiration at what we've been able to accomplish uh, in our watership with this program. And Lisa, I am just blown away. You, I, you never appear to be so busy or hairy. You know, whenever I see you, you look so calm. You know, how do you pull that off? I don't know. But I just, I'm in awe, and I think it's great. And, and um, I would certainly be in favor of, of seeing this uh, new position created. And as John says, it looks like we're going to a, a third as well. And Connie seems to be here to say that we can do this. Okay, Mr. Yokums, would you like to share any comments with us? You're on, you're on mute. You need to unmute for me, please. Thank you, sir. Did that do it? That did it. Okay. Uh, oh, well, our case is beautifully made in our packet. Uh, and to that, I only wish to add uh, that this has been, uh, this is very important to the board, has been for several years. Uh, and uh, we uh, 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 want it uh, to fully reach our potential. And, uh, and so the board strongly um, supports this. The funds are there. There's no question about that. And they're dedicated to just the, the healthy rivers matters. Uh, we have the desire to do more. You can see that from the uh, listed projects uh, in the uh, in the packet. And so all we're waiting for is uh, is you folks to say okay. And when you do, and when we get going, uh, I'm confident that you will be. Uh, proud of what we do and uh, we will be a credit to uh, to the county and to the program thank you that's all thank you well um i have just a few comments um yeah i think we we've been talking about this for a while i think lisa's given us the information that we were asking for as far as john throwing out a third party a third person today um, um i have no necessarily I, I mean i understand the need for a technical expertise but i think that's another discussion i think we need to move forward looking at this position and i cannot help but mention that i would like to see some in-house space either a shared touchdown space so that we um, have the ability to have this department not totally out of the building um, because i think with finance and with the bocc and our i think the bocc's interest and passion for the healthy rivers and streams program I think that would be of benefit to everybody. So that's for a future discussion, Lisa and John, as to where we might be able to, you know, get some touchdown space in, in and I mean, in this house, not in their own homes, but in this house that we're, I'm sitting in today. So um, I know that Kelly will be interested in this because Kelly is the one who was really requesting uh, more information. So hopefully we can have Kelly, you know, um, involved in this decision moving forward. But um, I think it's, we're going to put it, we would be moving it to Connie, the next supplemental budget request. Is that correct? Uh, yes, we will probably be bringing a midsummer 
supplemental to the board. Uh, we've got a number of issues that the board has heard over the last month or so that um, really shouldn't wait until September. Right. So that okay. will be coming back soon. Okay, so if we can touch base with both Francie and Kelly, but I think you're hearing it from the three of us who are part of this meeting today that we would like to have that discussion come back with the midsummer um, supplemental budget request. Am I am I in agreement with uh, you two gentlemen, Steve and Greg, on that? Okay. So, anybody oh, else want to? Yeah. Uh, if I could weigh in just one sure. more comment. Sure. Um, I see this as being enabling us to really unlock the potential of the Healthy Rivers and Streams Board uh, because they've been shorthanded in terms of staff. Basically, there's been so many big projects that have been going on, but having two people really engaged in it full time, uh, we could really see huge progress from where we are now. Uh, and I'm really look forward to that. Okay. Is everybody good? Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Bill, it's nice to see you. Thanks hey, for calling thank in. Thank you. Okay, we are Ooh. moving along Thanks, here. Everybody. <laughs> so Charlotte is here. I, I'm not sure either. I don't know if we have, we have two interviews coming up, two citizen boards, one with Bob Plessett from, for our telecommunications advisory board, and one with Kevin Mickelson, Mickel or Michael? Mickelson. Mickelson for planning and zoning. So... I don't we see don't we're, we're we're early. We are being extremely efficient today. <laughs> yeah, so Patty, we could. But I, I think uh, if the board, given that uh, these are scheduled with uh, potential citizen board members, it's unlikely that um, we'll see them change their schedule. I'm guessing. I emailed them, but I'm not sure yeah. if they'll get well, that. Well, we so have. It may be worthy of a break. Well, we have a half an hour. We have 35 minutes. And we've already done open discussion and future agendas. So what, what's the pleasure of Steve and Greg? What would you like to do? We, you know, I'm afraid to let Steve go. We may never find him again. <laughs> I can give you the latest COVID numbers. Uh, we're we're going we're gonna to get the latest COVID numbers, and I want you to make a public appeal plea for people based on the Delta variant issues in our neighboring counties to please that's funny i actually give me just a second okay. i was not planning on doing this so just i cannot believe i'm giving john time to do a COVID update <laughs> yeah, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna work on the presentation as we're chatting and michaela if you would just keep me in the loop if you see anybody thanks okay mm -hmm. thanks charlotte yeah so i'm gonna try you sent me down a, a you copied something here. Did, was this for you? Oh, okay. It's a P and Z. Yeah. I, it, I, it came to my attention. Oh, really? Well, Elaine saw it and brought it in. Oh. Are you all seeing that screen now? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, just uh, quickly, some of the key numbers that, that we're tracking. Um, not surprisingly, uh, and, and as you'd anticipate with our mobility uh, data going up, we are seeing our case counts uh, increase. Um, we're going to really be watching this two-week period post 4th of July. Um, I, I think uh, anyone that's been in town or tried to get in town <laughs> even today uh, sees we, we are pretty busy. and so. Um, this is the, the test that I think we were anticipating for this summer about how the vaccines uh, are going to protect. Uh, within our Central Mountain Retac, um, we're currently at the 76% of ICU beds in use. Um, you'll recall 85% is the threshold that the state is using uh, to reevaluate uh, restrictions. and so. Um, it, it's hovering probably a little higher than, than we'd like to see uh, in, in that regard. So we'll be watching that over the next couple weeks too. To your point, Patty, um, you know, we're on the right track right now, but this isn't over. Um, 
Delta variant, uh, especially in Mesa County right now, one of our neighboring counties uh, is really struggling with the uh, spread of, of the Delta variant. Uh, you see uh, in, in daily reports, if you're keeping track in the paper, their, their numbers um, have, have been consistently high. Um, so we're, we're watching that. Um, we do have uh, sequencing uh, from our testing locally here for the Delta variant uh, occurring. And we're really going to be watching what happens uh, after the 4th of July. Um, we're lucky we have high vaccination uh, rates overall, um, certainly higher than the national and, and state averages. And so um, right now the evidence is that those vaccines are still protective. Uh, against, against these variants, maybe to a somewhat lesser degree in terms of, of incidence rates. Um, but we, we still need folks to, to um, be a little careful. Um, I shared this before, but just wanted to share again. On 2021, uh, Picking County was named uh, in the top 25 counties by U.S. News Report and the Aetna Foundation as the, the healthiest counties uh, in the nation. Um, and they went ahead and uh, took those top 25 healthiest counties and ranked them by COVID deaths versus population. And uh, this is a list you want to be at the bottom of. And Picking County is uh, at the bottom by a rather significant amount, uh, I might add and that our, our deaths to, to population uh, through the time of this study, um, we were the lowest among the 25 healthiest counties in the nation. Um, and I, I think that speaks volumes about um, the protective measures that our, our health department and our board of health uh, put into place. Um, and, and more importantly, how our community uh, stepped up, particularly while our incidence rates were high, we clearly protected vulnerable populations. And and it, you know, I, uh, sorry, I often hear that it's it's because we are already a healthy county. Well, we we perform performed well even against the healthiest counties uh, in in the nation. Um, but to, to the point, Patty, that I think you were making when, when we started this is um, we do have these variants that, that do spread more quickly. They um, a, appear to have more significant uh, health impacts. And so uh, still really important for us to um, you know, practice responsibility and respect uh, with each other uh, and, and as a community. Um, we're really focused on now, we, we've moved from the five commitments to containment to the four healthy best practices. Um, anyone who wants a vaccine in Picking County can get one. Um, even if you're not from Picking County, uh, you, can, you can get one here. So getting vaccinated uh, is really our, our best, best protection. Um, continue to socialize smart uh, in terms of you know, uh, know, knowing the people that, that you're uh, socializing with and when you're in mixed groups outside is always best. Um, you know, uh, avoiding crowds when, when possible. Uh, and, and when in doubt, mask up. Um, and if you're feeling sick, do not show up. Do not show up to work. Do not show up to those social events. Do not show up to that uh, theater or music performance, we need to protect the ability of those groups to continue to operate by, by keeping our numbers low. So um, even if you're feeling those symptoms that you're pretty sure are allergies this time of year or the summer cold, stay home. Uh, don't, don't, don't take the risk and, and don't put others at risk. And as we've all learned, <laughs> keep, that was well timed, Michaela. <laughs> <Those days. laughs> um, and as we've all learned over this year, just keep washing your hands. Well, I want to add to that too. So many people who think they just have had a cold and have the wherewithal to, even though they're vaccinated, to go get tested, there are people that have been testing positive, whether mm -hmm. it be to one of the variants or whatever. So that's why it's important to just play it on the safe side 
And, um, you know, if you're not feeling well and the testing is still available and it's still free, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, if you go to one of the testing sites or, and we, it's on the county website where you can find out where testing is available. I think throughout the valley, you can pull it up. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you're in Carbondale or Glenwood Springs, where, where your opportunities are to be vaccinated and tested. Yep. And there are, you know, masking, um, still encouraging there. There are a lot of venues that are requesting, um, or requiring masks uh, when you go in. Aspen Valley Hospital, for example, is still requiring masks and, and screening as, as you go in as a, as a best practice. Just really ask people to comply um, with those requests and those uh, added protective measures um, and to honor those who are choosing to take those protective measures uh, for themselves even when it's, it's not required. Um, and, and to honor those requests uh, to, to do it yourself. So um, we are on the right side um, right now still of this battle uh, with COVID, with our vaccination numbers and um, where, where our data stands. But this pandemic is far from over nationally or internationally. And so we, we still need to keep our guard up and, and uh, continue to monitor and continue to take protective measures uh, with each other. The other so thing, there, that's the, my... Well, the oh. other thing, too, um, reading about an event that happened, it, I think it was in the Netherlands, maybe, 160 people, because people used fraudulent vaccination cards. Mm. I, I just think that's totally unacceptable. This is not a game we're playing. Um, when you're playing with people's lives and people's livelihoods. So, you know... If you're if you're choosing not to get vaccinated, it's your choice. But please don't get a fake vaccination card so you can go to a concert or something and not wear a mask because you're putting others around you at risk, especially with variants, especially with the Delta variant, which is proving to be fatal in mm -hmm. a lot of cases besides intensive care, um, hospitalizations, ventilators, um, and probably um, lengthy, maybe lifelong lingering effects. So. Please just be honest with yourself and honest with those around you. And, um, and you know, if you're not going to get vaccinated, that's a choice that you have the right to make. But please don't expose others around you. And Patty, thanks for bringing that up because I can guarantee you it is easier, cheaper, and safer to get a real vaccine than a fake vaccine card. <laughs> so it, it just makes sense to Especially do. Especially if it comes back on your conscience when those mm -hmm. are around you and somebody gets significantly ill or fatally mm -hmm. ill. Um, you know, the onus is on you as an individual. Greg? Um, thanks for that. I, I really hadn't contemplated fake vaccine cards because I haven't heard about them here. But um, I'm just wondering what sort of incidents do we have of it? What evidence do we have that that's an issue here? Um, and then what penalties are there uh, and do we need to look at that and who, who would consider penalties if it's not us or the Board of Health but then uh, the other question was um, can you update us on what's happening with Mesa County and Garfield County because um, I hear more about them and the rates of Delta variant than I do uh, I think we're doing pretty well by comparison but it looks it, the appearance is that it's coming this way yeah so um Greg, I, I wasn't actually prepared to do this, uh, believe it or not. I, I'm pulling these up on the fly <laughs> to, to uh, give you an update. So I don't have the specific data from Mesa County. What I do know um, is the, the daily numbers have been between 40 to 60 uh, new cases. Uh, it does appear that a majority um, of the cases are among uh, unvaccinated and that the Delta variant is becoming the majority um, uh, cases in Mesa County. That is not, I believe, true in, in Garfield County, but I think you're starting to see it come up through um, Western Garfield County. Uh, and of course, we share a lot of workforce and population with both, uh, frankly, Mesa and uh, Garfield counties. Um, and so we're monitoring this closely. Uh, I know the state is monitoring what's happening in Mesa County uh, very closely because of the high incidence uh, of Delta variant uh, that, that is occurring there. Um, I do know that Mesa County's um, vaccination rate um, is 
uh, much lower right now than than picking counties. Uh, to to go back to your first question, our numbers are based on confirmed doses given. So we we don't but within our percentage of population vaccinated, there there's not any room for for um, fake vaccination cards or such. And and I don't think we have any known incidents of it uh, here. But it is something that's starting to come up in the media and, and we're going to need to to probably um, think about particularly if our incidence rates really start going up unexpectedly that's probably a sign that either the vaccines aren't working or those who say they are vaccinated aren't um, right. and and right now we're not there um, well, so and that, if exposures that's good. are coming from an event where we know they were requiring proof of vaccination and i think that's what happened in i think it was the netherlands where everybody had to mm. show proof of it they had a significant outbreak yeah. so it, it's just something just for people to be aware of but uh, i have a real quick question yeah. what do we still have moderna pfizer and johnson and johnson available that is a great question i i think the answer to that is yes but uh, i would need to double check with our team just for the public so the public would know i i know we've been trying to keep uh moderna uh in play because it is you know it, I think that has been approved for the lowest age group at, at this point. So um, people I, have, you know, I mean, people, a lot of people who've been holding off have been doing their homework, mm -hmm. researching, watching the numbers, watching the news on all sides, and um, they may have a vaccine of choice because yeah. of the homework they've done. So I want to make sure we have those vaccines of choice available. And according to our COVID-19 website, all are available. Great. All Okay, thank you. So all yeah. <laughs> vaccines are available, and you can go to the county website, um, and they'll provide information as to where vaccines are available mm -hmm. and how you can register to get a vaccine and testing also. So the public needs to know that we are still on track with that and still providing those services. And vaccine. Who's oh, I'm sorry, Anyone Patty. who wants them. Yep. Go ahead, John. At no cost. I just At wanted no to. Cost. Thank you. Yeah. So um, on the fly, that's, uh, that's that all I good. have for you. That was good. <laughs> And you kept it under an hour and two, hour and a half, hour I think that's the first one. <laughs> Did any, Greg, Steve, do you have questions for John on our quickie COVID update? And it looks like Kevin was here. Okay, Steve, please. So, Patty, um, just wanted to give a quick report on my flight here. <clears throat> Both planes I flew on were 100% full, every seat taken. The airlines are being absolutely adamant of that you have to be masked on the airplane in the airports also once you go in the mm. front door you have to have your mask on and the only time they allow people to take them off is if they're eating or drinking something right then so uh, people are complying very well in the in the airports um outside the airports it looks more like i was in grand junction Went through Grand Junction last week. Uh, Fairbanks is kind of the same way. Some, mm -hmm. Quite a few people with masks, but the majority not wearing masks in stores or uh, on a street or anything. Well, they aren't required in Grand Junction, so mm -hmm. it's really a choice. I, you know, it's, I appreciate people who are choosing to wear a mask when they're in situations where they feel uncomfortable or just because they may not be vaccinated or maybe because they're concerned about the variants and others around them. Um, so, uh, you know, again, you have to be respectful and honor people who choose to wear a mask and, um, and, and kind of vice versa when you're in areas where you're not required. Mm -hmm. So it's an interesting saga that continues. Yep. So I do believe that um, one of our applicants for, I believe it's Kevin Mickelson from for applying for planning and zoning and Kevin you are on and do we need anybody else here from Ellen was going to join um, and she she may be on here in a few minutes but um, well let's know. proceed slowly since we do have <laughs> Kevin here hi Kevin welcome so Hello. a quick process we do a you know, 10, 15, 20 minute interview with you. At, right now, it's just Steve Child who is calling in from Alaska. He zoomed into the meeting. Greg is, is zooming in from home. I am in the office. We, um, so we are gonna start with 
I'm asking you if you would like to give us a little background or why you're interested in applying for the Planning and Zoning Commission, which is one of our most important commissions that we appoint people to. So please, go ahead and introduce yourself and give us a little background. Well, my name is Kevin Michelson, and I've been living in the Valley since 1996, and I started working as an architect around 2000 and I've, I've been in the field for over 20 years and uh, I'm looking for a way to contribute in the Valley is what I'm interested in doing and I feel like this may be a good fit and so here I am. Uh, that's about it. Well welcome and we thank you for taking the time to apply and I'm going to look at the two other members of my board who are on this on this Zoom meeting, this interview. So, Greg or Steve, do you have any questions or comments for Kevin? Steve, please. So, Kevin, good good to see you again, and uh, thanks for applying for this board. There is, you have some competition for the one open seat right now, just so you know. Um, I'm curious, uh, in your career as an architect, how how often do you run into uh, issues on projects that have to go before the P and Z board? Uh, what's been your experience if you have had any any projects that you have to kind of go to the P and Z board and present a case for it? Well, I've been involved in a number of land use applications and. I think I've been in front of a hearing officer once, and that's about it. Uh, I have not had to go in front of the P and Z board and plead a case of any nature. Most of the time, it's a single-family residence on, you know, an established lot or something of that nature. So there haven't been any major issues in anything I've dealt with. Uh, but I've certainly you know, read in the paper issues that come up and how decisions are made but no personal experience. Right, thank okay, you. and the reason I asked that would be, you know, kind of trying to assess what's the possibility that you would have a conflict of in interest on a case uh, that you would have to recuse yourself from. It sounds like it's a low, a low chance, not an impossible chance that you, you wouldn't have, have a situation like that, but um, what's your feeling about the whole issue of the house size, the growth management quota system, the TDR program that uh, the community development is going to be taking a hard look at starting this fall and going on into next year? Well, that's a difficult question. Everybody has different opinions there. Um, you know, I think that our current system has worked relatively well uh, in the past. Um, there's certainly a lot of large homes in the valley, and, and I can understand where people are coming from to try to reduce the size of that. And I would, I'm not necessarily opposed, and I'm not in favor. I would just have to listen to each side and try to understand what I think is best. Uh, you know, I'm not necessarily a fan of the monster homes in the valley in general. I don't necessarily, I don't think it's necessary. Uh, but at the same time, I've worked on them personally in the past. And, you know, so I've made a living in many regards that way. But it wouldn't be my first choice of the projects to be working on. Uh, I'd, I'd rather work on homes that are less than 5750 and that's what I've done in the recent past, and, and that's where I would prefer to be, uh, but that may not constitute the majority of the work mm -hmm. in the Valley. Okay. All right, anything else, Steve? Okay, Greg? Yeah, great, Kevin, thanks a lot. It's, uh, it's, I've been looking at your resume. It's, uh, of course, I'm drawn immediately to the Whitewater team as a, as a former kayaker, but nowhere near a competitive level kayaker. Um, but, uh, and all the other stuff you do, it's like, yeah, you clearly you're a local, you're a resident, you fit in. Um, uh, and that's great. 
it's great to know you've got some history here. Super helpful. Um, and then I see you've got a really strong math, science, physics background. Um, you know, one of the issues we're all wrestling with is, you know, how do we adopt a cogent, coherent climate action plan to, you know, for lack of a better term, maybe it's a carbon mitigation plan. Um, how do you, how do you see, uh, homes, buildings, uh, you know, construction pivoting in, in the future if necessary? What, what's your take on that? Is this, uh, is it necessary? And, and do you think we can do this? Yes, I do think it's necessary, and yes, I do think we can do this. You know, the, the challenge in the past has been that the building codes have been at, inadequate, basically, and so you get homes that are not so energy efficient as a result. And uh, the code, the recent code changes have been enacted to, you know, see more energy efficient homes, and, and I've experienced it firsthand, you know, having a plan and tell people that they need to put more into their buildings in order to be energy efficient. So I think we're on the right track and, and you know, making the codes more stringent uh, is, is the path. And, and I feel like we've followed that in the recent past. So uh, I would just in, encourage the same sort of effort uh, in the future. Yeah, that was great. Thanks. If I could also just, uh, as somebody who's practical, if you're in the middle of this. Uh, I, don't, I don't know what your living situation is like in the Valley, but, um, you know, some of the, some of the coding changes we've proposed and have discussed have, have, uh, made people nervous only because, um, you know, a, a lot of people depend on the appreciation or the potential increase of the size of their home after they sell, you know, as, as their retirement plan or, so, we, so what we're, the, the decisions we're making are really affecting uh, longtime locals, people in the community who are landowners or property owners who've been, you know, paying the mortgages all those years. And, and I, I've, I've certainly heard, and I'm sure PNC have as well. And I'm just wondering what your perspective is on, on that. You know, what, what's practical and possible? And, you know, my thoughts on what's fair, what's practical, what's possible. Um, where's the low-hanging fruit, <laughs> you know, for... You know, as we're as we're trying to navigate this and do something, you know, that's it's effective regarding carbon mitigation. Well, I guess that's a tough question. You know, I, I feel like the values of all our properties are overvalued in the in the valley in general. So. You know, when, when someone comes in and buys something that's already overvalued, you know, they don't necessarily want to see a decrease in value. Uh, the longtime locals that have been here own something for ages, you know, should have seen the value of their properties increase. And I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't be opposed to some code change that drops the value of my home, as an example, because I feel like it's already you know relatively high um it's no i don't have a good answer for you i guess i would say yeah i i, I didn't expect you to but i i, I know that, it, that that's the sort of thing you'll probably be spending some time deliberating <laughs> you know if you get to get into this gig but um it's uh it's a it's a it's a tough one and it, it seems as if you have the um, you certainly have a, a, a resume that would show that you're able to, to deal. You can do the math. That's good. You know, and and uh, and you've got the architectural experience. So um, it, it's it's the relief to have you come in and, and see that. And, and I'm trying to look at when you first hit town. You've been in town for 20 years or so, or working in the, in the valley that long. Well, I I first came here in 1989 when I graduated high school, and I worked as a lifeguard at the James E. Moore Pool before it was the Ark. And, uh, yeah, so I've spent a lot of time here. I actually skied here as a kid with my family. You know, we came and, and I certainly call this home and, and I appreciate it. And, you know, you know, going back to this question about the valuation and the land use changes, you know, I, I would want to see as many sides of the story as I can. You know, I, I'd like to hear somebody present their case that, you know, this land use 
code change is really going to affect my evaluation in a negative way and, and I'm not opposed, therefore. And I'd want to hear the other side too. You know, I don't want to see big homes or, or whatever the case may be. And so you just have to weigh them both out and, and try to see what the community wants for a long-term solution. You know, that's kind of the tricky uh, landscape that you have to navigate is, is to figure out what the community really prefers. So, um, Kevin, I want to thank you. Thank you for again for applying, and I too found your resume very interesting. So, if you worked at the James E. Moore, you must have worked with Kelly Kelly, way back. For sure. Okay. And yeah. Mike, both of my kids learned to swim. Greg, you may have learned to swim there also. I don't know. Um, and then you you did some time over at Fort Lewis College, where both of my kids went to college. And then you teach at oh. the ski company, um, where both of my kids teach for the ski company. So you got kind of a track record here with the Clapper family. I don't know, but um, I do. I appreciate your your um, your various experience with different projects and different um, architects throughout the valley, which I think has probably given you a good sense of what's happening um, valley wide as far as building. So. Um, you know, I, I just so you know, I will have the other two commissioners. Charlotte will give them a link to this interview, so both um, Kelly and Francie will be able to watch it when we take into consideration. And Charlotte, we have we have three people applying for this seat. We don't have any more applicants to interview. Um, no, we do. We have one that's being scheduled right now. We have one more. So yeah, and then is the application period closed now or? Yeah. Okay, so it'll take us some time to vet this out, so don't be surprised if, if you don't hear back tomorrow. Um, we'll get back to you as soon as we can, and again, our thanks. Do you have any questions for us? Because we're here to answer questions back for you. Well, I mean, quite frankly, I'm not 100% sure, you know, what's involved in the position, and, and I guess I'm curious what you guys are looking for when you're filling this position, I, I've heard that there are a number of lawyers on the on the advisory board and a builder, and you know what 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 would you like to see the board look like? Well, I think one of the concerns of one of the commissioners was a little more diversity. Um, I myself am looking for somebody who's willing to read a lot of information, um, digest a lot of information. Um, I sat on planning and zoning for some years before I became a commissioner. It was, it was, it's it's a lot of work, and it's um, some some applications can be very lengthy, and you have to be very diligent, um, and you have to be it, it's an investment of your time and energy, um, and also you have to be willing to ask the tough questions and and um, seek information, and that's what's really key. Um, especially when we're going to be going through this process of kind of reevaluating growth management as a whole. That's going to be upcoming over this next year, end of this year, beginning the end of this year, and then on into next year. So um, we've, we've got a lot, a lot going on with planning and zoning in the future. So, and that's a time commitment. And I think that's, that's of concern. And, and if you're ready to take it on, that's something you might want to let the board know. Okay. I'm in. Okay. Thank you. So we will get back to you all as right. soon well, as we've you. had time to digest it. And again, I'm sure we all are giving you our thanks for taking the time to apply and for being part of our community. All right. Stay safe out there, Kevin. Thank you. Bye-bye. By any chance is... Um, So we still are lacking. He is on uh, as an attendee. He'd have to be moved over to a panelist. Yeah. Thank you, Steve. All right. So, Bob, welcome. Thanks for, for um, attending our meeting. We have you on, so you can probably click on your speaker and your camera so we can um, have you join us. There you are. So welcome. Um, we've all had a chance to look at your information, your application, and I want to welcome you and I want to thank you for, for taking the time to apply for this position. And um, our general procedure is we interview for anywhere from 10 to 20 minutes or so and 
I don't think we have any other applicants for this board, and we have openings? Two alternate, Two alternate openings. Um, this board has grown significantly over the years because of funding issues and broadband and a change in the use of our fund, um, which has kind of bringing us into the new age of technology, slowly but surely. So is there anything you would like to start off by telling the board about yourself that was not included in your application? And you need to unmute. <laughs> Which is, oh, there you go. You hear me now? Yes, perfect. Thank you. You hear me now? Yes. Thank you. I was on the phone. I was, when I jumped on initially, I was, I guess I got on a little early. So I caught the end of the interview with the previous person. And I, I wasn't sure whether my, it was my computer or my phone or whatever, but here I am. Um, so um, I'm, uh, a relatively new uh, uh, resident of uh, Aspen, Pitkin County. Um, we moved here in full time in 2018 um, and recently uh, purchased a, a home finally in the Brush Creek Village area. Um, and I was I actually came upon you in, in a bit of a, uh, uh, you know, sort of a coincidental way. I I was uh, looking through some um, Pitkin County websites uh, in particular for trying to find some, some information, building uh, plans information, and somehow don't remember exactly how stumbled onto a telecommunications advisory board. And, you know, I've been in the sort of the telecom, the business telecommunications field for pretty much my whole career going on almost 30 years now. And, um, you know, I was curious. And so I, I simply, you know, emailed and, and ended up speaking with, uh, I, I believe, Jeff uh, Kruger and talking a little bit about my background. And he, he encouraged me to apply. And, uh, you know, I'm interested in, 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 you know, I don't know many details, of course, about what exactly what the, the, uh, uh, the committee does. I was on some committees in my previous life in, in, in Miami, Florida. Related, I lived in the city of South Miami, and I was on a finance committee, and I did a couple of things uh, on, you know, with the local government. So I have a little bit of uh, uh, familiarity with that, but um, I figure, you know, maybe this is a, a good way to sort of contribute back a little bit to the community and become more involved, and and um, and so uh, here I am. Great. Well, again, again, thank you. And um, uh, how often does the does the I'm not hearing you. How often does it do they meet? They, TB. Uh, I'm asking Charlotte. Sorry. You hear me fine. <laughs> yeah. Let me see. Just to give you a little more information. I can't hear you. <clears throat> but Jeff. Jeff. Hey, Patty. Yeah, Jeff's I'm here. Call yeah, Patty, on my meet, phone. The uh, telecommunications the advisory here. board meets on on every Sorry. quarter. They eat once a quarter a or a more a necessary, yes, but you could call special meetings if need be, if there's a project that comes up that you need some communication with the board, right? Correct. So, Bob, you can hear us. Is that right? Can you hear us? Hello now. You hear me now? We can hear you. And let me go here. Can you, can I hear you? We can hear you. You can't hear us. Now I hear you. Okay. Thank now you. you're Long, good. Long speakers. Okay, so this board, yeah, this commission meets once a quarter, uh, but special meetings can be called if need be and may or may not happen. But um, there's been a lot going on as far as improving our systems, building new communication sites, refurbishing old communication sites that need to be refurbished. So uh, Jeff's been yeah. keeping everybody pretty busy in his department, but. Um, it, it's a great group, and um, I think you would enjoy them. Um, I think they would enjoy you. So I'm going to ask my other two commissioners who are on. We have two commissioners who are absent from today's meeting, but they will be linked into looking at your interview um, before we make a decision. And um, the, we have no other applicants, and we do have the two openings. So um, 
so again, thank you for, for taking the time to apply. And I'm going to look at Greg and Steve to see if either one of you have questions. Greg, please go ahead. Sure, Bob, welcome to the community and, and welcome to the neighborhood. I'm in Brush Creek as well. So I'll have to figure out, uh, we, we, we can triangulate, figure out where you are relative to me. Yeah. Um, uh, as Jeff will, will testify, I often complain about the, the weak signal from some of the public radio stations and others up here, certainly after snowstorms, and I, it's one of those things I keep hoping we can fix someday. Um, uh, but I'd, I'd be interested in hearing a little bit more about your history in, in uh, communications and audio, and uh, it looks pretty fascinating if you could tell yeah. us a bit more. Um, well, I, I'll give you a quick uh, history. I grew up in Pennsylvania, went to school in Boston, ended up in Venezuela for a couple of years after college, and came back uh, and got a job with a guy who was in the uh, communications technology business outside of Washington, D.C. He wanted to open up a market in Latin America. He sent me down to Miami, and for about the next 10 or 12 years, I did a lot of work in Latin America, traveling around, mostly as a sort of a salesperson, sales engineer, in, in the uh, private communications, business communications field. So it's anything related to what we call PBX systems um, and, and networks, networks for businesses. Um, I worked for a few years for him, ended up starting my own company in 1993, which I still have today. And um, we, we really are in the, you know, we're still in the same business, you know, and we've gone through a few different, you know, iterations, but, uh, and, and transformations, but, but primarily we, we provide technical uh, services, engineering, project management, consulting, uh, expert guidance to, businesses of a certain size or organizations of a certain size to help them manage their networks. And so I, I, I know a bit about the networking side of what I think you guys do. So, or what the, I think the, you know, the, the, the county is trying to achieve in terms of um, internet and providing, you know, broadband and, and these types of things. The, the television side and the radio side, not, not, not as, you know, uh, uh, knowledgeable with because that's just sort of outside of my professional, you know, knowledge, my professional expertise. Um, so, um, well, you know, yeah, that's that's basically what 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 I do. Uh, I manage, and I've had the business for you know a number of years. Obviously, and we've been, you know, of different sizes, and and now I have a team of about ten people who are. Um, you know, experts in, in, in helping businesses run uh, their networks, and I manage that team, and I manage some, some of our clients. Uh, great. So I'm, I'm wondering how, um, how do you see that background of helping, uh, helping guide our, our telecommunications board? Well, you know, I, I would. I, mean, I don't know exactly what the what what you know you need, but I certainly have some experience with um, hardware and software and building hardware and software and how that works and what are the things that you have to look out for and sort of that whole process of managing uh, a system and a solution with vendors and multiple vendors. And so, you know, I might be of assistance. You know, in terms of the business side of that, of, of those, you know, uh, arrangements that the county has and determining, you know, what to do and how to do it and what are the things to look out for and, and these types of things. Great. Yeah, it seems like you know the, you know the language, you know the vernacular. Uh, so I, it, it makes sense. Thank you. So yeah. thank you. Thanks. Steve, you have questions? Okay. Steve, please go ahead. Yeah. Thanks, Bob, for applying. Um, one of the things we really look for in people who are, you know, serve on this board uh, is sort of the ge geographic distribution of the people on the board to different parts of the county. Yeah. So they're they're getting their radio and television signals from from different sources and have different levels of service in different parts of the county. So I'm just curious, uh, you know, when you listen to 
FM radio, uh, what stations do you look, <laughs> listen to? Uh, if you watch any of the local television stations that come off of the, yeah, the very, mountaintops, uh, what, what do you watch for? The, the radio, I do listen to the radio, and I, yeah, I listen to the public radio. Um, and in particular, I listen to, what's the K, KDNK? Uh, that's 88 in Carbondale and 99.9 in Snowmass. And I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, is that the antenna that's on top of Brush Creek? No. The, the radio antenna, the TV antenna that's at the very top of, of Brush Creek Village, when you go all the way to the top of the road. So that's yeah, I've, I've seen that. that. Jeff might know. No, it's not. Our, our towers um, for both of those stations either operate off of um, Upper Red Mountain in Aspen or Williams Peak in Snowmass, Old Snowmass. And I, I was always wondering because I get really, you know, pretty poor uh, signal <laughs> and I have to go down and sort of, if I'm going down Valley, you know, I can, I, I get better signal connecting to Carbondale <laughs> than I do to, um, to Pitkin County. So I was, I, I was wondering, I was like, why am I not getting a better signal off of that? Because I thought that's what it was. I thought that was the tower. I, is that a private station up there? Is that somebody who, what is that one up there? I'm not actually familiar with yeah, the Brush Creek Tower you're referring to. You up in Wildcat. It. Yeah, you, it's up in Wildcat. It's at the very top of this Aspen Ridge Road. You go all the way up Juniper Hill, and you come to a private road, and you keep going up and up and okay. up. Okay. It's up yeah, there. That's, uh, yeah, that is a, a private tower. Okay, I know it's one you're talking about now, the one off Wildcat. So, yeah, that so is a private tower. Steve, to answer your question, those those are the stations I listen to. Uh, uh, the public TV, only in passing, actually my wife, the first year that we were here, um, did an interview. She's into um, uh, holistic health and, you know, nutrition and, <laughs> and these types of things. And she ended up getting interviewed. So I, I watched her on TV. That was my 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 biggest exposure to uh, the, the, the local public uh, 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 television station. That's the one that's run over the red brick, correct? Yeah. Correct. And I yeah. don't think you had much oh, choice in not today, watching that. Yeah. <laughs> so you are live right now, Bob, just for your information on that same station. Awesome. And so people will be watching this for weeks or months. Um, <laughs> they can refer to same meeting right now. Yeah. Yeah. And hopefully, I'm sure, they'll, they'll be fast forwarding. They get to my part. Yeah, and, and hopefully your wife is watching you this time on local TV. Oh, I, she, I had no idea that this was going to be. I thought this was a, a, a private interview. I did not realize that this was part of the public, uh, uh, you know, public uh, meetings. So don't be surprised when people recognize you at the grocery store. Uh-oh. <laughs> so is there any other questions from the board? So the process now, Bob, is to um, to uh, have the other two commissioners watch this interview, and then we'll bring it yeah. back for discussion. And um, since the application period is closed and you're the applicant, we should be getting back to you sooner than later. And again, I really want to thank you. I appreciate Steve Scott. Steve, go ahead, and then I'll, I'll wrap up. Go ahead, Steve. I just remembered that there are two um date two different dates for how long these two terms the two seats that are available have different ending dates um i don't have my packet right in front of me but one was like maybe a year long term and another one was maybe a three-year long term i know let's ask charlotte so let's ask charlotte when we do renewals i change those dates so that not everything expires at the same time so that's why there's a difference. So we can choose okay. a, we can choose either one. Yeah, and uh, that might be a question to ask Bob right now. If you would you if we you I mean you don't have any competition for this job. I feel reasonably <laughs> sure we're going to appoint you to this. <laughs> because you have some good qualifications. Obviously, uh, would you like to have a longer a longer term or a shorter term? given the knowledge that i mean people can resign from these committees anytime they want anyhow but that well, it would be your choice 
Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I have a, 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 a son who is going into seventh grade, so I, I'm going to be around for for, for the, the next, uh, you know, several years. Um, and so, yeah, whatever term that is required, uh, I'm, I'm, you know, happy to, to fulfill. And we can make that the full term. Yeah. And, and we can decide that. It's like, what kind of sentencing do you want here? You want the <laughs> life term, you know, a life sentence, or do you want to have parole in five years? So, yeah, we'll, we'll figure yeah. that out when we have our broader discussion. But again, Bob, it was a pleasure to meet you. Welcome to our community. And um, be careful, Greg is a next door neighbor, so we want to warn you about that. And um, we'll see you down at the, uh, at the mail stop. Yeah. The and you can talk about the fact he doesn't get that, that radio station that he wants so um, we appreciate it we'll get back to you and again our thanks thank you very much okay thank thanks, you Bob. thank you Kim. all right back to the BOCC we should be done Oh, that's right. I'm sorry. I got Good thing I'm keeping track of you over there. Um, I think we, we've done actually really well. It's amazing what you can accomplish when there's only three of you at the table. Um, for a while there, I thought it was just going to be me, so we, would, we may be here for hours. But um, Steve, thank you for joining us from the, from the faraway territory of Texas, of Texas, of um, Alaska. Alaska. <laughs> And um, yeah, it's a beautiful mountain peak. The weather doesn't look like it's changed at all it's the whole time you've been on, online with us. So, and Greg, thank you. And um, I guess that's it for us today. Does anybody else has anything they'd like us to challenge? We're good? We're good. So thank you. And uh, gentlemen, I will see you again next week. Thanks. Okay, thanks guys. Soon. Thank you, Grassroots. Thank you, McKellar. Thank you, staff. We appreciate it.